Shalom. My name is Adam, and I welcome you to the parable of the vineyard. Every day, Yahuwah is waking up a remnant, a group of people who are coming out of deceptions, realizing our walk is to consist of faith and obedience to His righteous commands. Each week, we read through and examine a portion of the Torah, allowing the Spirit of the Most High to guide, teach, and open our eyes and ears to the wondrous matters out of His law. Join us as we seek to be refined by His Word, preparing ourselves for the return of our King of Kings, being faithful and obedient, walking in His way, truth, and life. Shabbat Shalom and welcome back, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Parable of the Vineyard. My name is Adam and I welcome you. This is our Torah portion study. We're uh, getting back. We're re restarting our Torah portion series. This is week one. We're going to cover Genesis 1-1 one, one through 6-8. Um, this is probably one of the largest Torah portions, probably with the most information uh, available to us. Um, a lot of just solid foundations that we need to establish here in this Torah portion. So incredibly important. Um, normally in the past, I've broken it up into two parts because there's so much, but I think we're going to try to condense it into one. So this may be a longer video, but obviously if you're here, um, you're probably not worried about that. You're just here to study the Torah just like I am. And speaking of that, um, I just want to say up front, for those of you that may be new to watching this channel or watching the Torah portions with us, um, the way I create these is in a study format as in Let's study together. Um, uh, let's hang out in. We're just like we're hanging out in my living room. Although I can't see you, but you know, we'll you know, one day, one day we'll all be able to see each other and hang out, right? Um, and and the reason I say that is because we're all new to Torah. Uh, most of us are just first generation Torah keepers. You know, the, even though I grew up in Judaism, I don't think that puts me ahead of anyone because uh, I've, I've, I've had to unlearn most of the stuff I learned from my childhood. Um, and so I, I just, I know that Yah has put me in a teaching role, but again, with it, when it comes to the Torah portions, um, I, I, I really can't uh, stress it enough that this is like a, a study. We're studying together. Um, I'll always leave all my study notes in the description box below, and I'll try to remember to pin it as a comment as well. That way you can have my study notes as well. Uh, the reason I like to do this is I, I really my goal here is to empower you, especially uh, you men at home, uh, raising your family, uh, leading your family. It, I don't want you to have to watch these videos all the time. Uh, I'd like to give you all the um, all the things that can help you uh, run the Torah portions in your own home. Uh, that's what I believe really, you know, being fruitful and multiply is also this knowledge. It's not so that you have to come to me all the time, but I like to just share this wisdom and understanding that Yah has given me so that you can turn around and do the same for your family or even uh, however else he, he may lead you. But um, sorry, I don't want to get too wordy before we get started. And also, I'm sorry about the camera flickery thing. I've tried everything I can, including getting a new camera, and it just keeps doing this. So I really apologize if it's a distraction. Um, anyways, also, as far as the timing, you know, um, a lot of people restarted the tour portion cycle in the fall. It was just put on our heart to start it at the beginning of a true new year, uh, which for us was uh, April, the evening of April 9th. And so that's why we're starting the tour portion this, uh, this, uh, this way. So um, I also wanted to let you know we're going to be this year we're going to be going off of the um virtual house church uh s schedule that rod skiba used to have so we're going to be here in bear sheet now when we do these torah portions i'm only going to go over the torah portion uh, so we'll be going over genesis 1 1 through 6 8 however there's the prophets there's the new testament um and so there's actually quite a bit and so we'll just be going over this and this is obviously something that uh, you can be reading on your own time or with your family during shabbat however you decide so with that uh just a couple things before we start um the name of this Torah portion is Bereshit, the beginning. And I just want to just kind of remind ourselves of 
really the whole story. Um, in John eight twenty five, the Pharisees said to him, Who are you? And Yahushua said unto them, Even the same I have said unto you from the beginning. If he was speaking in Hebrew, which I believe he was, he would have said, Even the same I have said unto you since the Bereshit, which literally is the first word in the scriptures. In the beginning, in Hebrew, would be Bereshit. So literally, Messiah is like, Hey, I'm the same person. I'm the same uh, voice. I'm the same uh, word that you'd heard from the very beginning. And that's truly what Messiah, uh, I believe what Messiah was talking about when he says, um, Moses wrote of me, and so all these all these things here, and we'll we'll cover that in just a second. Lastly, uh, the reason we're doing this is, and this is, I encourage you, uh, adults and and children, uh, to memorize Psalm one. I think it's just one of the most important psalms, and uh, it just lets us know that. We should be abiding in the Torah uh, day and night, and this is something I even need to work on. I, I'm um, obviously when we do these Torah portions, we're abiding at least once a week, uh, but something that I think should be on the forefront of our mind day and night. So, uh, blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight, listen, his delight is in the Torah of Yahweh, and in his Torah does he meditate day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in the season. His leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked shall not rise in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For Yahweh knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the sinners shall perish. Listen, your children can learn this. Uh, my eight, six, and four-year-old uh, are able to do it. So that means, parents, you can do it. Uh, and of course, you can teach it to your children. I think it's just so important. Uh, and I don't know about you. I want to be like that tree planted by the rivers of water. That's why every year uh, we're just going to continue to study the Torah over and over. This is the foundation of everything else we read in the scriptures. So uh, with that being said, let's get into it. Actually, let's pray and then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, Yahuwah Most High, we come before you and bless you in Yahushua's name. Father, we thank you for the Shabbat. We thank you for your word. We thank you for everything we're about to read. We ask that your Holy Spirit, your Ruach HaKodesh, will be with all of us as we study your word, Father, that we may understand what you're asking of us, of man, and to attempt to understand your ways. We know that your ways are higher than our ways, Father, but we know that you've left these words for us that we can we can know of your glory, and we can know of the glory that you've given your son, Yahushua HaMashiach, the word. Father, we just uh, we bless you and thank you for this day of rest and refreshment in Yahushua's mighty name. Amen. Hallelujah. Yahuwah. All right. So here we are. Genesis 1-1. This is the heart of Torah, the creation, the works of of his hands. This is no light matter, brothers and sisters. Let's get into it. So what I think I'm going to try this year is I'm just going to read a whole chapter, and then we'll kind of go back and I'll touch on some things that I want to touch on. So here we go. Bereshit. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Ruach, the spirit of Elohim, moved upon the face of the waters, and Elohim said, let there be light. And there was light. And Elohim saw the light, that it was good. And Elohim divided the light from the darkness. And Elohim called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And Elohim said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And Elohim made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And Elohim called the firmament heaven, and evening and the morning were the second day. And Elohim said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And Elohim called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And Elohim saw that it was good. And Elohim said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And Elohim saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. And Elohim said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for appointed feasts. The Hebrew word here is moedim. And for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And Elohim made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. 
And Elohim set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light upon the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And Elohim saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And Elohim said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that has life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And Elohim created great sea monsters, and every living creature that moves, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And Elohim saw that it was good. And Elohim blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let the fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And Elohim said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And Elohim made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps upon the earth after his kind. And Elohim saw that it was good. And Elohim said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So Elohim created man in his own image, in the image of Elohim created he him, male and female created he them. And Elohim blessed them, and Elohim said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And Elohim said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for food, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creeps upon the earth wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. And Elohim saw that everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So a lot there, um, and obviously I want to cover quite a bit. But uh, just from a general perspective, um, you know, we talk. If you're here, you probably want to learn how to walk out Torah. You're probably convinced. Um, uh, you're probably convinced that we, as followers of Messiah, should be keeping the Torah as He did as well. So when we go through the Torah, we're learning about what we should do and what we shouldn't do. But the Torah isn't just limited to do's and don'ts. Uh, this again, this is the heart of the Torah. Um, this is this is His witness of saying, "Hey, this is what I've done. I have created this earth, and we, as the people of Yah." should all should stand up for creation. We'll talk about that in just a second. But I want to also just, I want to read this. This is uh, 2 Ezra 6, 1 through 6. Just in case you're new and you're like, what's a 2 Ezra? Uh, this was included in the Apocrypha section of the 1611 KJV uh, and the 1560 Geneva and many other Bibles. It was taken out of the Protestant Bibles in the mid-1800s. But uh, 2 Ezra 6, 1 through 6 says this, And he said to me, At the beginning of the circle of the earth, before the portals of the world were in place. So we were getting like a little idea of what it was like even before creation. Before the portals of the world were in place and before the assembled winds blew and before the rumblings of thunder sounded and before the flashes of lightning shone and before the foundations of paradise were laid and before the beautiful flowers were seen and before the powers of movement were established and before the innumerable hosts of angels were gathered together and before the heights of the air were lifted up and before the measures of the firmaments were named. And before the footstool of Zion was established, and before the present years were reckoned, and before the imaginations of those who now sin were estranged, and before those who stored up treasures of faith were sealed, then I planned these things, i.e. creation, and they were made through me and not through another. That, I, that's just one thing that I just want to establish is that Yah is in total control. It, I, there's so often, I believe, that we inadvertently may give credit to man or to the devil for this is happening in the earth, this is happening in the earth, or especially uh, those of you that are understanding that climate change is, is really um, 
is really just a cover story so that people don't read the Bible. So like when things start happening, they're like, oh, it's you humans. And oh, it's you have too many cows, you know, passing gas. It's ridiculous. Everything in this earth is under his control, whether he operates it himself or has angels uh, operate part of his. Uh, we, we learned about that in Enoch, um, that angels are tasked with different uh, parts of his creation. But nevertheless, we have to recognize that all everything was made through him. Listen to this, just as the end shall come through me and not through another. So that's why I also just say, man, why are we giving the devil so much publicity when we're, we're like looking for the Antichrist or waiting for him? And or where is he? Where's the Antichrist? The end is going to come through Yah. Our focus, our heart should be on him. Our eyes should be on him. Our study should be about his ways. Why are we studying the devil's ways so much? So Yah created everything. I also want to read the Testament of Naphtali. Um, Naphtali was one of the sons of Jacob. The Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs um, were the last words of um, the sons of Jacob. Anyways, first, uh, Naphtali chapter 1, verses 14 through 16 says this, For as the potter knows the vessel, so just, you know, someone who makes pottery, they know what they're making, how much it is to contain, and brings clay accordingly, so also does Yahweh make the body after the likeness of the spirit. So he's saying, you know, the person who makes the thing. So just like a baker knows exactly how much flour to bring. So also does Yahweh make the body after the likeness of the spirit. And according to the capacity of the body, does he implant the spirit? And the one does not fall short of the other by a third part of a hair. For by weight and by measure and rule was all the creation made. So literally, everything was weighed out. It, it, everything was done with intelligence. It wasn't just some haphazard like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to like, eh, dirt sounds good. He like thought of everything. And obviously, when we look at creation of how everything works together, we know that his, I mean, his wisdom is just infinite. And the potter knows the use of each vessel, what it is meat for. So also does Yahuwah know the body, how far it will persist in goodness and when it begins in evil. So obviously he knew everything from the beginning and every part of his creation was meticulously detailed out. So here, now let's go back to Genesis 1.5. It says, And Elohim called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. So the first thing was he created light. Now, now we're not, obviously we, we if we can reason with one another, we know he's not, we're, we're not talking about the light of the sun because that wasn't created until day four or even the light of the moon, or even the light of the stars. But he created the light on day one. So what did he create? Let's uh, let's go through some scriptures. And again, everything we're covering today, I'll have um, in a... Um, um, I'll have a... Um, my study notes, sorry. So Proverbs 6.23. So what is the light? For the commandment is a lamp, and the law, the Torah, is light. That's what it says. And says, and, and reproofs of instructions are the way of life. So the Torah is light. Can we back that up with multiple witnesses? Yes, we can. Psalm 19, 8, the statutes of Yahuwah are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of Yahuwah is pure, enlightening the eyes, which means giving light to the eyes. There's more. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp unto my feet. Of course, we know his law is his word. His word is his law and a light into my path. So your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. Isaiah 8 20 to the law and to the testimony if they speak not according to this word the law it's because there's no light in them there's a couple more uh actually I want to share this real quick a neat little passage from second Ezra 14 we're going to be reading a lot of second Ezra it really ties into the creation but second Ezra 14 20 through 22 says this this is uh when Ezra is tasked to go reprove uh the the people of Israel but here's what he says, For behold, I will go as you have commanded me, and I will reprove the people who are now living, but who will warn those who will be born hereafter? For the world lies in darkness. Remember, he separated the light, right? He separated the light from the darkness. Yep. Right here, I'm sorry. And Elohim divided the light from the darkness. So, for the world lies in darkness, and its inhabitants are without light. Why? For your law has been burned, and so no one knows the things which have been done or will be done by you. If then I have found favor before you, send the Holy Spirit into me, and I will write everything that has happened in the world from the beginning, the things which were written in your law. Listen to this. 
that men may be able to find the path and that those who wish to live in the last days may live. Hallelujah. So hopefully you can understand with, with multiple witnesses that the light is is the law. And when the law is created, you're able to separate the light, the what's good, what's right, from what's wrong. So that was the very first thing he did. Uh, we have another witness here in 2 Ezra 7, 70 through 74 says this. He answered me and said, when the Most High made the world, so we're talking about creation, and Adam and all who have come from him, he first prepared the judgment and the things that pertain to judgment. You can't have judgment without the law. So if he first prepared the judgment, he first prepared the law. And now understand from your own words, for you have said that the mind grows with us. For this reason, therefore, those who dwell on earth shall be tormented, because though they had understanding, they committed iniquity, and though they received the commandments, they did not keep them, and though they obtained the law, they dealt unfaithfully with what they had received. We're going to find out next to our portion that when uh, Noah came off the boat, he gave all his sons the Torah. We'll also find out here uh, in this Torah portion that when Enoch was in the world, he gave all the sons of men the law. They, of course, just decided to walk away from it. And just in case if you're like, oh, Adam, the law wasn't given until Sinai, that's actually not true. If we go to Genesis 26, 5, it says, Because Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So we know it preexisted Mount Sinai. Um, verse 3, what then will they have to say in the judgment or how will they answer in the last times for how long the time is that the Most High has been patient with those who inhabit the world and not for their sake but because of the times which he has foreordained. So we talked about he first prepared the judgment and James 2.12 rightly says, so speak and act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. So if the judgment was first created, that means the law was first created. Romans 2, 12 through 13, all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before Elohim, but the doers of the law or the Torah will be justified. So even us studying this right now, just reading the Torah and being excited, be like, yeah, I want to do Torah. It doesn't mean anything unless you do it. So we need to be faithful hearers and doers. Hallelujah. So uh, also, again, he Elohim called the light day and the darkness he called night. So uh, we'll go right here. Proverbs 4, 18 through 19. But the path of the just is as the shining light that shines more and more unto the perfect day. The way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. So uh, Yah, at the beginning, separated, right here, I'm sorry, divided the light from the darkness, right here, divided the light from the darkness. He separated what was good and what was evil. And those who walk in the Torah are as the light, and those who walk not according to the Torah walk in darkness. Isaiah 59, 7 through 10, their feet run to evil. So we're talking about evil people here. And they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace, this is another term for the law, they know not. And there is no judgment in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. Whoever goes therein shall not know peace. Therefore is judgment far from us. Why? Because they're not walking in the law. Neither does justice overtake us. We wait for light, but behold obscurity. For brightness, but we walk in darkness. We grope for the wall like the blind, and we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noon as it, I'm sorry, we stumble at noon as in the night. We are in desolate places as dead men. These are um just like we read earlier in Psalm 1, uh, we become like trees planted by the rivers of water, which obviously is never thirsty. Even if it's 120 degrees out there, it's those roots are like, mm -hmm, we're good. Mm -hmm. So in a similar way, we need to understand biblical terms like what's the light? What's the darkness? Uh, and that's why uh, when you understand these terms, uh, it'll help you, of course, study the rest of the scriptures. Let's, uh, let's go to 1 Thessalonians... 5, 1 through 8. But of the times and of the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the master, so com or the day of Yahuwah, so comes as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. 
But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should take you as a thief. You are all children of the light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Now, some people will be like, um, some people will say um, that people who keep a morning to morning Sabbath are children of the day and people who keep evening to evening Sabbath are people of darkness. Um, I couldn't disagree more. I think that's a huge stretch. I believe that this is simply talking about people who, and this is Paul talking about you are children of the light because he knows that he instructed or he um, taught uh, the brethren to, to walk in the Torah, contrary to, of course, what mainstream Christianity teaches. Uh, but we are children of the light. That means we walk in the Torah. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Hallelujah. So we are a children of the light. Hallelujah. Or at least we should be. So let's move on now. Uh, verse 6 here, Elohim said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Now, I will say also, it just so happens in this very first Torah portion that there's a lot of um, topics that uh, are big topics of disagreement. And what I'm sharing with you is just the understanding I have. I could be wrong on some of the things that I see here. And you may hear me say some things that you're like, I never want to listen to this guy ever again. I hope that's not the case. But just keep in mind, I feel called to share what I believe he's shown me. I, again, that doesn't mean I'm perfect, uh, but here we go. So it says, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And Elohim made the firmament and divided the waters, and listen to this, which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. So we have some sort of separator uh, here. And so let's see exactly what this is. And the word here is, um, sorry. The word here is firmament, and the Hebrew word is rakia. Uh, what is rakia? Uh, it's an extended surface. It's solid. It's expanse. It's a firmament. It's an expanse. It means flat as base or support. Uh, the firmament of the vault of heaven supporting the waters above. Now, what is that? Um, especially uh, considering what we've been taught all of our life, of how what the solar system looks like and what the earth looks like um what is above us that separates water from above and water below what is that uh considered by hebrews as solid and supporting waters above uh it says here the visible arch of the sky firmament so let's take a look uh this is what some people have hypothesized what the firmament looks like this right here actually is we'll go with this one this is what is being described uh, from everything that we can see here. This is what's being described as a firmament, the arch in the sky separating the waters above the firmament from the waters below the firmament. This is kind of what it's explained. This is what it's explaining to us, right? Flat as base with a support, the arch, the visible arch in the sky. So, um, you know, obviously uh, that's a lot different than what we're taught here. Because in this solar system, I don't understand, maybe some of you out there can help me, those of you that uh, don't understand this as our cosmology, maybe you can help me, uh, comment section, or if you want to keep it private, email me. I don't understand what the waters above the firmament could be if this is what Earth looked like and this is if this is what the solar system looked like. I just, I can't get on board with it. So maybe help me out. This is what I believe, a little more of, of what we live on. I believe that, because also remember he said, or we haven't got there yet, but he said that uh, this is actually not really a good representation, but he says he set the sun and the moon in the firmament. And again, I just don't know what that looks like here, setting the sun and the moon in the firmament. I'm just, so that's why uh, I no longer, um, I no longer align with what NASA teaches as far as that. Um, so, we see a little something like that here in Second Peter, Second Peter three, three through five. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, "Where is the promise of his coming?" For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of Elohim, that's our Messiah, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. So he's kind of referencing this moment here. Um, 
where it says Elohim made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. This is probably one of the best representations I have. Now, what exactly does the earth look like? First of all, I don't trust NASA's pictures. There's a lot of evidence of Photoshop and things like that. So I don't believe uh, the blue marble picture that they have. Actually, if you do some research, the blue marble has changed several times over the years with completely different uh, ratios of land size. Uh, I just don't trust it at, at all. Um, for those of you, for those of you that are like, "What is Adam talking about? This is crazy." Um, I'll leave a link for you. It's just there's a couple of videos, maybe three or four videos. It's called um, um, Biblical Cosmology Basics. Uh, you can at least do your own research. Um, but myself and many others are no longer trusting what uh, the stuff that um, um, that they're teaching us. Uh, because you know, even as a child, this never made sense to me. I'm like, this makes no sense whatsoever. Um, none of it. And um, as soon as uh, I started really reading the scriptures for what they were, uh, something like this made a lot more spit sense because um, there's tons of verses that says uh, the sun moves around in a circuit uh, with the solar system. It, it just, anyways, um, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I don't also want to shy away from it. I know that uh, many people have told me over the years, just stop talking about this and, uh, you know, more people will listen. That's not my goal. As I said from the beginning, uh, getting views, getting uh, amassing subscribers is not my goal. My goal is to um, receive the receive the understanding that I have and to share it and to be fruitful and multiply. Um, so I'm not seeking popularity here. I'm seeking the truth. Um, so there, based off of what this firmament is, I think there's a lot of research, uh, you know, uh, to be had here in this, in this category. So again, I will leave a, a link for the playlist for the biblical cosmology. Uh, if I, and just in case I forget to do it, just click on playlists, scroll through the playlist and just find biblical cosmology basics. Um, if it's important to you. If, and it may not be important to you, and that's cool. Genesis 1.9 says, um, And Elohim said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. People have speculated that in the beginning when he first created, it was one just one big landmass. And there's some evidence here that if the, all the waters were in one place, and then the dry land appeared, to me it sounds like it could have been, I think they call it Pangea, I don't know what it's called, but literally it's just one big landmass. And then we see here later... Um, Next to our portion, actually. Um, no, that's the wrong. That's the wrong one. Uh, it's Genesis 10:25. It says here, 10:25 uh, of Genesis. And unto Eber were born two sons. The name of the one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided. And it's not not the people were divided, but the earth was divided. Is it possible that at that time the earth uh, started separating? I, I don't know. Uh, that would be obviously a cause of massive panic and whatever if people were living and then all of a sudden, you know, it's drifting away. I don't know what that would look like. Uh, this is definitely not an area of expertise. Just kind of mentioning some things that uh, I've learned over the years. Um, that's not really uh, that topic there is not really solid with me, but just something to think about. Um, OK, what else here we got? So in verses 11 through 13. It's talking about uh, bringing forth the grass and, and the, the trees. I want to read a second Esdras parallel for that part of the creation. Um, just a little, like a little extra uh, bit of information. Second Esdras 6, 42 through 44 says, On the third day you did command the waters to be gathered together in the seventh part of the earth. Six now, so here we go. So this this is actually, uh, now I forgot about this. I forgot this, this passage existed. This kind of actually um, contradicts uh, what I was just sharing with you about a Pangea. Six parts did you dry up and keep. I'm sorry. Six parts you did dry up and keep so that some of them might be planted and cultivated and be of service before you. For your word went forth, Messiah, and at once the work was done. So there's this is also may give you us a little insight as to actually how creation was done. And it seems though, and we'll read it in a little bit, that in the book of John, it says that everything that was made was made through Messiah. So perhaps Yah is the father of all and everything was his grand plan. And then he was like, hey son, let's make dry land. Let's make dirt and trees. And the son's like, Let's do it. And he went and, and did it. So that's what it says here. For your word went forth, and at once the work was done. To me, that's what it sounds like. For immediately fruit came forth in endless abundance, 
and a varied appeal to the taste. Thank you, Yah. And flowers of inimitable color. Hallelujah. And odors of inexpressible fragrance. These were made on the third day. Think about how awesome our Yah is. I don't know about you. Um, I love um, essential oils. Like I love frankincense. I love myrrh. I love smelling these things. I love smelling flowers. What about you? How about varied appeal to this, to the, a varied appeal to the taste. Any of you foodies out there? I love food. I love the different flavors and taste of food. I love, you know, the, the cumin and I love uh, chili powder. I, Hispanic um, and Mexican food is my favorite. So I'm, I'm thinking about making fajitas and stuff or uh, some taco meat. I, I mean, just think about the different flavors and some of some we like and some we don't like. And I would, as I caution my children when they're like, ew, this is disgusting. Hey, y'all made all these flavors, okay? Maybe I mixed it wrong, whatever, but let's not like call what y'all made bad. Because remember, at the end of this chapter, everything he looked at everything that he had made which includes uh ticks and spiders and he said all of it's good right so we've been trying to get into a habit of not saying what yah has made uh, as being bad right even ticks all right i'm trying to even say it not even say i hate ticks anymore <laughs> but seriously what an amazing elohim that gave us varied tastes for us to enjoy hallelujah the beautiful cl- uh, colors and uh praise yah Praise, yeah. Uh, and it also says here, um, it says in verse 12, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And so I wonder, should we be eating fruit that is seedless? I don't know. Then we get to Genesis 1.14, and Elohim said, Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for appointed feasts and for days and for years and so here in genesis 114 he is saying the sun and the moon both of them will be for signs and so this brings up of course a topic that i just spoke on uh, just a, a day or so ago uh um talking about who is responsible for the eclipse and i was shocked i didn't know that so many people gave uh satan credit or man credit for doing that mighty wonder in the sky where genesis 114 says that the sun and the moon his creation do those things um and then also likewise for appointed feasts and so i know there's lots of different calendars out there uh i don't judge anybody based off their calendar um however just where i'm at he said the sun and the moon both together are used for the appointed feasts and to count days and years so that's why if a lot of you email me i'm sure a lot of you listening you know may follow a solar calendar i just is why i I just can't get on board because I see here, just in the very beginning, the first page of scriptures, that we're supposed to use both. Um, we'll actually have a video uh, coming out in the next week or so on the, the solar calendar and, and some of the disagreement there. Not Only in love, not to judge anyone, but just because I get emails and letters and comments galore, like railing on me, like, how can you not do this solar calendar? It's the only right calendar. It's the, it's the Zadok, Enoch, Priestly calendar. It's like Yah's calendar. It's the creation calendar. Adam, why can't you get on board? Uh, well, it's taking me a few years to speak on it, but I'll, I'll, I'll be sharing my thoughts here in the next week or so. Leviticus 23, one through four, this is talking about the appointed times. And Yahweh spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, Concerning the feasts of Yahweh, so remember, these aren't Jewish feasts, these are, these are Yah's feasts, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, aka get-togethers, even these are my feasts. Now, as a lot of people will properly uh, point out, the Shabbat is a feast, but here on the Shabbat specifically, he tells you how to calculate it. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Shabbat of rest. A holy convocation, a get-together. You shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of Yahweh and all your dwellings. Then he goes on to say here, these are the appointed times, the feasts of Yahweh, even holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their appointed times. And that goes back to here, the sun and the moon, they shall be for the appointed feasts, appointed times. So this is why also just a little quick uh, tidbit, why I can't get on board with the um, the lunar Sabbath is because I believe he tells you right here how to count the Sabbath. And then he tells you right here how to do his other appointed feasts. There's a separation there. Uh, speaking also about the sun and the moon, let's go to the second Ezra's account. Uh, second Ezra six forty-five through forty-six. 
On the fourth day, you did command the brightness of the sun, the light of the moon, and the arrangement of the stars to come into being. And you did command them to serve man who is about to be formed. And this is another thing I just want to touch on, uh, just because some of you may see these comments out there. Uh, because I, we do a loony solar calendar, uh, every month we look for the new uh, sliver moon. And so people would say, well, because I look at the moon, I look for it, that I'm, I'm worshiping the moon. Uh, that's not the case at all. He says right here that these luminaries are to serve us. How are they serve us? To show us signs, to help us uh, pinpoint the appropriate time for the feasts, to count our days and our years. And, and of course, that obviously would in include months as well. But literally, it, we're, we're supposed to observe these things, observe the position of the sun, uh, to know the, the timing of the, the spring, uh, spring season, um, uh, the moon for the months, uh, and so on and so forth. So anyways, um, so I just want to mention that. Um, also, I want to read from the book of Sirach which is known as Ecclesiasticus. This is also included in the 1611 KJV in the Apocrypha. But however, this is also included in the Greek Septuagint, which is one of the most renowned uh, Bibles or canons uh, in history. Uh, it was the Bible, basically the time of the apostles or, and, um, and the Messiah. But this is Sirach 43, 1 through 12. It's going to be talking about the sun and the moon a little bit. It says, The pride of the heavenly heights is the clear firmament. The appearance of heaven in a spectacle of glory. The sun, when it appears, making proclamation as it goes forth, is a marvelous instrument, the work of the Most High. At noon it parches the land, and who can withstand its burning heat? A man tending a furnace works in burning heat, but the sun burns the mountains three times as much. It breathes out fiery vapors, and with bright beams it blinds the eyes. Great is Yahweh who made it, and at his command it hastens on its course. He made the moon also to serve in its season, to mark the times and to be an everlasting sign. From the moon comes the sign for the feast days, a line that wanes when it has reached the full. The moon is named for the month. I'm sorry, the month is named for the moon. How about that? Increasing marvelously in its phases, an instrument of the host on high, shining forth in the firmament of heaven. So I don't even need to say, it just kind of says exactly what it says there. The glory of the stars is the beauty of heaven, a gleaming array in the heights of Yahuwah. At the command of the Holy One, they stand as ordered. They never relax in their watches. Look upon the rainbow and praise him who made it, exceedingly beautiful in its brightness. It encircles the heaven with its glorious ark. The hands of the Most High have stretched it out. Hallelujah. Great are the mighty works of Yahuwah. I also want to just share here, um, Genesis 1.17, this is the inter interlinear. Uh, this is a really good uh, tool if you want to uh, just check the Hebrew, on, the exact Hebrew on different verses. And it says, and set them in the firmament. So when you look at the birakia, that means in. Like this is how we know, because the word is rakia, but this type of use is like is birakia, which means in the firmament. This is what I was saying earlier that he set the sun and the moon inside of the firmament. Um, let's keep going. So uh, now verse 19, or I'm sorry, uh, verse 20. And Elohim said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that has life and the fowl that may fly above in the open firmament of heaven. So this is when he's creating all water life and um, all the birds. Let's go to Second Ezra chapter 6. Verses 47 and 48. On the fifth day, you did command the seventh part where the water had been gathered together to bring forth living creatures, birds, and fishes. And so it was done. Done. Excuse me. The dumb and lifeless water produced living creatures as it was commanded that therefore the nations might declare your wondrous works. Oops. So, seriously. Um, this is part of the meaning of life to declare who we serve and what he has done. This is Enoch 36, verse 4. And as often as I saw, I blessed always Yahuwah of glory. And I continue to bless Yahuwah of glory, who has wrought great and glorious wonders to show the greatness of his work to the angels and to spirits and to men that they might praise his work and all his creation that they might see the work of his might and praise the great work of his hands and bless him forever. That's part of the reason he made creation is like, hey, I'm making this for you. And it just, it, 
it hurts my heart when people don't give him credit, when people don't give him any glory and give it to, you know, evolution and Darwinism and, and things of that nature. So we should care about his creation. We're going to go to the book of Gad the Seer, which was referenced in First Chronicles 20, 20, uh, 29, 29, and also alluded in the New Testament quite a bit. We're going to go to chapter, I probably could have just clicked that link and gone to 8, chapter 8. Oh, wow. we got a ways to go. We're going to go to, to the book of Gad the Seer, chapter 8. We're going to start at verse 8. He says, this is David speaking. As for us, we will worship our Elohim, who is our king, our master, and our savior, with love and awe. For your wisdom begins with the fear of Yahuwah. And if you truly understand him, you will depart from evil. Remember and obey the law of Moses, the man of Elohim, so that you will live a blessed life all of your days. Ask your fathers, and they will teach you. Ask your elders, and they will instruct you. Do not just listen to the law, the Torah. But be strong and valiant to obey all of it. Hearing is like the seed, but a deed shows that the seed has taken root in you. It then becomes a tree of belief which produces the fruit of the true righteousness. What becomes of a smelly rotten seed if no root will come out of it? So hurry, be quick to hear and act. For if you are a true seed, if you have belief and righteousness, then Yahweh will bless you all with peace. Live in peace with each other. Come on, Torah movement. <clears throat> Love the deeds and those created in the image of Yahuwah like your own selves because it is a sign that you love the creator if you love his creation. We're not to worship his creation, but we're to love and appreciate and thank him for his creation. You cannot take hold of the one, but withdraw your hand from the other. Love Yahuwah and also man so that it will be well with you all the days of your life. And think about that for a second. Man, each other is part of his creation. Even the people that are astray and people that are just wicked, have pity on them. Mourn them. Pray for them. Yah loves his creation. Second Ezra 8.47. He's talking to Ezra here. For you come far short of being able to love my creation more than I love it. So, we're supposed to be, we're called to love the things he loves, right? Praise Yah. So let's remind ourselves of his glorious creation, just real quick. So let's just look at his amazing, some of his amazing creatures he's made. This is one of our favorites. The sea turtle is awesome. Look at what our Abba made. And if you're like, oh, come on, Adam, I know what these look like. We're just, like I said, we're studying together. Look at what he's made. Uh, just absolutely amazing. The water dog. <laughs> oh, man. These are my kids' favorite. Oh, that's just a generated image. Even this guy. Is that a paddlefish? Oh, man. Those things are crazy. I'm sorry. Crazy is the wrong word. Those things are w uh, wild. How about that? Anyways, you get the you get the idea. How about these things right here? How about this? I mean, what is going on? Amazing. Hallelujah. I always love these comparisons when you can see the size. I mean, look at, look at the elephant compared to an elephant. Look at uh, compared to one, one man. Our father's creation is amazing, brothers and sisters. Absolutely amazing. Okay, uh, so the the water creatures. Now, how about the the fowls? Um, so, j just reminding ourselves of who did this. This is my favorite bird. I just love the deep red, even though red's not my favorite color. Blue is. Uh, there's just something about the cardinal that I just love. And our father made this. Our father made these beautiful. Look at the intricate design. Everything was measured and calculated, like Naftali saw uh, said. Huh? He did what? Come on. Come on. Let's give our Father some love right here. Let's just bless him together. Father Yahuwah, 
We just recognize that you are the creator of everything and that all these things are the works of your hands. Father, we just bless you and thank you so much. We love you. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, man. And then uh, here, of course, verse, tw uh, verse 25, Elohim made the beast of the earth after his kind and cattle after their kind and everything that creeps upon the earth after his kind. And Elohim saw that it was good. So even the creepy things, I know, I'm not a big fan. Uh, how about this? glorious creature he's made so glorious that messiah is even called the lion of the tribe of judah huh how about cattle those of you that have cattle i tell you what man i went to africa i wonder if uh i wonder if uh yeah here we go i was like i have never seen horns this big when i was in africa i was like what is that these are some of the longest horns I've ever... These actually aren't even as big as the... Here, it was kind of like that. I was like, what is that? Now, that's a shofar I want to blow. Anyways, also, let's side note. Uh, thank you, Abba. Talking about varied taste. Uh, I think beef is probably my favorite. Favorite food. How about even these things? Our Abba made the most amazing things. Not a big fan. I'm going to be honest with you. Not a big fan. Not a huge fan. But... Look at the detail of his creation. So I no longer try to say I hate spiders and ticks anymore. Not a big fan, but I will appreciate our creator who made these things. I could do this all day, but uh, um, obviously you can do all this stuff in your own time. But I just wanted to do this together. Um, all right. You get the picture. You get the idea of what our father made. You know. This is just one of my favorite parts of the Torah portion is just to kind of just remind ourselves. And that's obviously that's probably just a tiny sample of all the millions of things that he's made. Um, and, and so speaking of that, I want to speak on something a little more serious, um, not as lighthearted. But what is the world in love with? These. And this is something I don't mean to offend anyone because I know some of you probably like dinosaurs. If you are uh, around my age, I'm 42. I grew up when when I was a kid, like. I don't know how old I was, was I maybe 10 years old when Jurassic Park came out. Uh, no, without even exaggerating, I think my dad and I went to watch it like 10 times while it was in the theaters. I was absolutely in love with dinosaurs, but I want to take a scriptural look at dinosaurs. I know that there's even a lot of creationists who uh, say that, that Yah made dinosaurs that, you know, in Job, when he's talking about the behemoth and the Leviathan, he's talking about a dinosaur. Um, I don't think so. I, I actually don't agree. Um, and so I'd like to just share with you a couple things as to why I don't believe uh, dinosaurs are from Yah. And, and if you look at the, the programming of how much they put dinosaurs in our face, ask your average 8 or 10 year old that's in the world and what their favorite animal is. They'll probably say a dinosaur. Just a wild guess. You walk into any major retailer like uh, Walmart or Target, look at the clothing. It's usually dinosaurs. Like, why? It's usually dinosaurs and spaceships and planets. You know, what? what is there an agenda? Uh, so where did they come from? Enoch 7. Uh, we'll just read this together real quick. This is talking about the angels that fell and mated with women. Check this out. And all the others together with them took unto themselves wives and each chose for himself one. And they began to go in unto them and to defile themselves with them. And they taught them charms and enchantments and the cutting of roots and made them acquainted with the plants. And they became pregnant. These human wives became pregnant by these angels and they bear great giants whose height was 3,000 L. So just pause real quick. So, okay, so angel plus human woman creates a giant, so a massive size in the flesh, right? Keep that in mind. Who consumed all the acquisitions of men, and when men could no, no longer sustain them, the giants turned against them and devoured mankind. Now this and this, I'm, this is talking about the angels, as I believe still is, and they began to sin against birds and beasts and reptiles and fish and to devour one of those flesh and drink the blood then the earth laid accusation against the lawless ones is it possible that they mix the angels mix their seed even with animals to create these massive creatures and that's why i think you can see uh some relation to other animals um uh, but just in a much in a giant form. Uh, there's another piece of witness or another witness in Jasher chapter four. In Jasher chapter four, it talks about the the judges and rulers, which I believe are 
uh, the angels themselves, we learn in Psalm 82 that these Elohim, it says Elohim stands in the council of the Elohim. So basically it says God stands in the council of the gods, you know, for a little plainer English. Uh, and that these gods are supposed to judge mankind correctly, but unfortunately they didn't. They were wicked. It's Jasher 4.18 says, And their judges and rulers went to the daughters of men and took their wives by force from their husbands according to their choice. And the sons of men in those days took from the cattle of the earth and the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air and taught the mixture of animals of one species with another. So DNA manipulation, making chimeras, in order therewith to provoke Yahuwah. And Elohim saw the whole earth and it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted its way upon earth, all men and all animals. So in my opinion, I believe not just the giants and the, and the, with the, the sin that the angels brought down. I believe that these dinosaurs were also a, a corruption in Yah's eyes, which is also part of the reason of the flood. He destroyed them all. Uh, even science will say that there is one event that killed them all. I believe it was the flood. But that's just where I'm at. You may disagree with me. Um, but I, again, I'm, I'm sharing this as in a study format of kind of what I learned over the years. Now, so for some of you, maybe like, what's the book of Jasher? Uh, Joshua 10, 13 says, and the sun stood still. Again, what does that look like in the biblical cosmology versus um, <clears throat> what they teach us? And the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So mentioned there, it's also mentioned in 2 Samuel 1.18. Also, he bade them to teach the children of Judah the use of the bow. Behold, it is written in the book of Jasher. So it's mentioned twice in the scriptures. Some people would say um, that's not the real book of Jasher. It's a fake Jasher. Um, in love, I just disagree with testing the book uh, over the last uh, few years. Uh, I believe it to be true. Uh, let's take a look at Genesis um, 1.26-28. through 28. It says... And Elohim said, let us make man in our image. I want to show this, the inter interlinear again. Again, this is where it allows us to look at each word. Uh, and it says, and Elohim, let us make man in our I image. So um, Hebrew acts, the Hebrew language works a little bit like Spanish. Um, uh, so like, let's say, let's take the root verb tener in, in Spanish. Tener is to, to have. Well, if I say tenemos, that means we have, or tango means I have. So you take the root word and it's uh, altered by uh, whether it's first person, uh, whether it's a group, whether it's an individual. Hebrew works the same thing. When you see enu, enu means our, our. So yeah, he's basically saying in our image. This is how we know that this is a, a truly a plural word. So when it says an Elohim said, let us make man in our image, well, there's only two options. There's only two options. Either, either, either Yah looked at the angels and said, "Hey, angels, let's make man in our image," or he said to his son, "Hey, son, let's make man in our image." I believe the latter. I believe that there's a literal father and a literal son, and that the father and son counseled together and said, "Hey, let's make man in our image." Pretty simple. But also, uh, it says here that we're supposed to have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and every living thing that moves upon the earth. So uh, he gave us he, he gave us charge. Um, uh, let's go with. Yeah, you know what? Let's read it. Psalm 8. Uh, I got Psalm 8 and Psalm 111 here. Oh, Yahuwah, our master, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Who set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings you have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you might still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man? It's like we look up and like we're so we're little, we're so nothing compared. Abraham had the same mentality. He's like, I'm but dust before you. What is man that you're mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels and have crowned him with glory and honor. You made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea and whatsoever passes through the paths of the seas. O oh, Yahuwah Elohim, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Psalm 111, praise Yahuwah. I will praise Yahuwah with my whole heart and the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. The works of Yahuwah are great, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. 
His work is honorable and glorious, and his righteousness endures forever. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. <clears throat> he has made his wonderful works to be remembered. Yahweh is gracious and full of compassion. He has given meat unto them that fear him. He will be ever he will ever be mindful of his covenant. He has showed his people the power of his works, that he might give them the heritage of the heathen. The works of his hands are verity and judgment. All his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever, and are done in truth and uprightness. He sent redemption unto his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverend is his name. The fear of Yahuwah is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding of all they that do his commandments. His praise endures forever. So again, just uplifting him and his creation. Proverbs ten twelve: A righteous man regards the life of his beast, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. So <clears throat> we're given, we're given dominion, rule over the animals. Should we rule them with cruelty and force and harshness? Ooh, I think not. I think we'll find out the same thing when it comes to to marriage. Even though he's given man dominion in the marriage or uh, um, <clears throat> the hierarchical position I believe that we're supposed to glean from how Messiah led right not as not as a uh, um, domineering authoritarian but in love right in tenderness just like how our Heavenly Father is with us at Revelation eleven eighteen, and the nations were angry and your wrath has come and the time of the dead that they should be judged that you should give reward unto your servants the prophets and to the saints and to them that fear your name, small and great, and should destroy them which destroy the earth. So, we're called to subdue the earth and replenish it, right? So, we're called to Genesis, <clears throat> Genesis 128 and replenish the earth and subdue it, not destroy it. So, you know, <clears throat> we shouldn't be people that just litter, you know. Obviously, things that are like, you know, a banana peel in the woods. Come on, that's, that's obviously cool or an apple or whatever. But I'm talking about like litter, like throwing plastic and we're supposed to replenish the earth and take care of it. This is not some like um, save the earth, climate change, recycling thing. This is just like a, hey, we're, we're called to take care of this earth that he's made for us and the animals. Like you have a dog, you have a cat, like take care of them, love on them. Don't be a cruel and harsh master. Just some thoughts. But obviously, uh, you know, I really didn't spend a whole time on this, but he, he made us. He formed us, right? He formed us from the dust of the ground. We are his creation, one another. So again, when you when you look at other people, uh, maybe that don't look with them in disgust because they are made in the image of Elohim. Even if they're not walking in it, they're made in that image. And remember Hebrews twelve fourteen, and we're called to do this. We're called to what follow peace with all men and holiness or righteousness, without which no one shall see Yahuwah. So if you want to see Yahuwah, you should follow peace with all men, because they are created in the image of Elohim. Does that mean you have to? be best friends with them or yoke up with them no of course not we can have our space we can have our distance we can have our uh, our fences but uh, certainly we can walk in love and peace with all men even if they um, hate us or are rude to us or whatever it may be so verse 29 it says an Elohim said behold I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in which the fruit of the tree yielding seed to you, it shall be for food. And of course, uh, later on, he calls this good. Uh, everything that he has made is good. And so uh, you may say to yourself, well, Adam, not all plants are good. Um, I would say, yes, they are. Even poison ivy. You're like, oh, poison ivy. It's the bane of our existence. Guess what? Poison ivy has a medicinal use. I, I, almost every single plant has some sort of beneficial use to it. Almost everyone. Even the thistles, like milk thistle right it's a thistle but it still has a use so with that we shouldn't also be people that call what yah has made evil i want to read uh sirach again ecclesiasticus chapter 38 4 through 10 it says yahuwah has created medicines out of the earth and he that is wise will not abhor them that means he won't hate them so even if you don't like it so um I don't like poison ivy. I don't like poison oak. I'm going to stay away from it, right? Uh, however, for someone that knows what they're doing, they can use it and make it into a tincture and whatever. There are some uses for it. Look it up for yourself. So if you want to be wise, you should. we shouldn't hate any of his creation. Was not the water made sweet with wood, that the virtue thereof might be known? 
and he has given men skill that he might be honored in his marvelous works. With such does he heal men and takes away their pains. So the herbs of the earth are for our healing, are for pain relief. Of such does the apothecary, the apothecary is someone who makes like tinctures, oils. Of such does the apothecary make a confection, and of all his works there is no end. And from him is peace over all the earth. My son, in your sickness, be not negligent, but pray unto Yahuwah, and he will make ye whole. Leave off from sin, and order your hands aright, and cleanse your heart from all wickedness. So I love this because it's not... Um, it's not encouraging us just to rely on the medicines of the earth, but also to pray to Yahuwah. So in this house, when we have um, something wrong physically, we look to Yahuwah first in prayer, but also thinking, you know, his answer may be like, I already made it for you. If you want, if you want some healing, if you want some relief, I already made it for you. We know that exists, and we also know miraculous healings exist as well. We've seen it in our congregation. We've seen it in our own home. Miraculous healing. And maybe he's like, maybe I want you to do both. Maybe it's a little bit like spirit and truth, right? We're supposed to worship him in spirit and truth. We know truth is the Torah. Psalm 119, 142 says the truth is the Torah. And then spirit, of course, we know is the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. So he wants us to worship him with both. Well, what if when it comes to the healing of our bodies, what if it's both? What if he wants prayer? And we shouldn't be negligent to recognize that Yahuwah created medicines out of the earth and he that is wise will not hate them. So even if people uh, speak evil about a certain plant or whatever or call it uh, demonic or whatever. Hey, listen, be careful. We shouldn't be calling evil what Yah has called good. So let's reflect back on uh, Genesis 1.26 that we that uh, they said, let us make man in our image. So there's more than one party here at creation. Uh, well, who was it? Uh, I The understanding I have is that you have a literal father and a literal son. I know a lot of people think that the son, Messiah, is also the father. We don't agree with that. Um, here's in Enoch, here's a vision in chapter 46, 1 through 3. It says, And I saw there one who had a head of days, and his head was white like wool. And with him was another being whose countenance had the appearance of a man, and his face was full of graciousness like one of the holy angels. And I asked the angel who went with me and showed me all the hidden things concerning that son of man. So we see the father and one next to him who is the son of man, who he was and whence he was and why he went with the head of days. And he answered and said to me, this is the son of man who has righteousness with whom dwells righteousness and who reveals all the treasures of that which is hidden because Yahweh Sebaot has chosen him and whose lot has the preeminence. That means he is more eminent, that he's higher than all of creation. Before Yahuwah of spirits and uprightness forever and ever. Uh, likewise, let's also go to um, chapter 48. And it says, two, so two chapters later in Enoch, and it says, In that place I saw the fountain of righteousness, which was inexhaustible, and around it were many fountains of wisdom. And all the thirsty drank of them, and were filled with wisdom, and their dwellings were with the righteous and the holy and the elect. And at that hour, that son of man was named in the presence of Yahuwah's spirits and his name before the head of days. Yes, before the sun and the signs were created, before the stars of heaven were made, his name was named before Yahuwah Sebaot. He shall be a staff for the righteous whereon to stay themselves. So like a support and not fall. He shall be the light of the Gentiles. Hello. And the hope of those who are troubled at heart. And it just goes on, uh, goes on and goes on. But this is talking about Messiah, right? Uh, also, let's take a look at John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. We know clearly from Revelation 19 that one of Messiah's titles is the Word of Elohim. So, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with Elohim, and the Word was Elohim. So, this is what I'm getting at here, is that the word Elohim, when we look at it, uh, oops, let's go here. When we look at the word Elohim, uh, it's the plural of Eloha. It's a plural word that means more than two, or more, I'm sorry, more than one, excuse me. Um, if we go here, um, oh, I want to do that for me. When we look here at the word Elohim, Elohim, right? It, um, very first, very first thing, plural. Um, Elohim, plural. 
right? So otherwise, the scriptures would have just read El or Eloha. So Yahusha was with the Father from the very beginning. And Yahusha himself is Elohim, as in not Elohim the Father, but Elohim the Son. And what I mean by Elohim is a divine, eternal being. Messiah was not just some righteous dude that Yah was like, hey, you're really righteous before me, and I'm going to choose you to be my son. No, this is the son that was with him in the heavenlies, and he came down and, of course, was entered into Mary, became a, a child, and lived a life like we do so that he can be our perfect example and our high priest. The same was in the beginning with Elohim. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything that was made that was made. So literally every part of creation was made through Messiah. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So I know it's often said, you, you may, most of you have probably heard this, that Messiah uh, is the word made flesh. But Messiah is more than just the Torah. He's more than the law. I'm not bringing Messiah down to, to, to that he, he is the law. He's more than the law. He's the, the, the law giver. He's the, uh, he, he and the Father created the, the law on day one. So he's, he, so what I'm saying is the law is part of creation and Messiah created everything. So Messiah created the law. So he's not just the law, you know, if that makes sense. Sorry. And the light shines in the darkness, and darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from Elohim whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not the light, John, but was sent to bear witness of that light, Messiah. He what That was the true light which lights every man that comes into the world. He was not in the world. I'm sorry. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of Elohim, even to them which believe on his name. Hallelujah. Praise Yah. Very thankful for Messiah and what he's given us. So, this is the creation story, and we need to declare it. Uh, just a couple of other quick uh, things, uh, examples. Jonah, when he's getting ready to be tossed overside, over the over, over in the water, and they said to everyone his fellow, "Come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us." This is the stormy ship, you know, storm, and they're in the ship, so they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. They they said to him, "Tell us, we pray you." And listen to the questions they ask him: For whose cause this evil is upon us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And what people are you? So this is just in, in similar to like people ask us, "Well, who are you? What, what, what do you do for a living?" This is how this is how Jonah answers. He said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear Yahuwah, the Elohim of heaven, which made the sea and the dry land. He's like, that's my answer. That's who I am. Can we get on, on the same page here? I'm talking to myself, too. That's how I should be like, you know, like, oh, my name's Adam, and I, and I, and I do this and this. No. I am, my name is Adam, and I, I'm a Hebrew, and I fear Yahuwah. Rejoice, uh, Psalm 33, 1 through 9. Rejoice in Yahuwah, O you righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. To give him praise. That's literally, if I can just step back for a second from a bird's eye view. I was just thinking, like, what what is the purpose of life? Literally, to wake up and to praise him. And to go about our day and praise him. And at evening before we, get, we go to bed, we praise him. And then we praise him and, and, and do his Shabbats. We do his feast days. We do all the things that he says that we should do. Literally, our life is about giving him praise and esteem and doing and acting like he's wanting us to act. That's it. <clears throat> if you hadn't noticed, there's going to be a time, or if you hadn't noticed in the scriptures, there's going to be a time where the kingdom comes down and certain people are going to be able to get in and certain people aren't. Literally, life is an application process to get into his kingdom. And it's very simple. Man makes it difficult, but it's very simple. Fear Yah, believe in his son, keep the commandments, and give him praise. It's that simple. <clears throat> praise Yahweh with harp. Sing unto him with psaltery and an instrument of ten strings. Sing unto him a new song. Play skillfully with a loud noise. For the word of Yahweh is right, and all his works is done in truth. He loves righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the goodness of Yahuwah. We just read about everything he's created, and it's good. 
by the word of Yahuwah, Messiah, were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathered the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the depth in storehouses. Let all the earth fear Yahuwah. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Again, what we read in Ezra was Yah's like, let's do this. And it, it says, at once your word went forth and did the work. Psalm 146, praise ye Yahuwah, praise Yahuwah, O my soul. While I will, while I live, will I praise Yahuwah. I will sing praises unto my Elohim while I have any being. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man. This is not talking about Messiah. It's talking about a little man in whom there is no help. His breath goes forth. He returns to his earth. In that very day, his thoughts perish. Happy is he that has the Elohim of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in Yahuwah's Elohim, which made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that therein is, which keeps truth forever hallelujah let's go to jeremiah 27 5 i have made the earth the man and the beast that are upon the ground but by my great power and by my outstretched arm and have given it unto whom it seemed meet unto me jeremiah 51 15 he has made the earth by his power he has established the world by his wisdom and has stretched out the heaven by his understanding even in the end times when these three angels give the very last chance for people, you'll see they say the same thing. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear Elohim and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. This is part of the gospel. It's proclaiming, remember, the... <laughs> the, the um, I mean, this is literally part of the gospel. He had the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, right? Saying, fear Yah, give glory to him, worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. That's part of the gospel. One of these days, I just want to do a video on what is the gospel. And part of it is standing up for creation. All right, I'm probably beating this to uh, like a dead horse here. Um, a couple more. Uh, Enoch 2, observe everything. So look around you. Go outside. We're, I'll tell you one big difference I saw from Africa to here. Um, when when they're done with work or school, everyone's outside. All Whole communities are just hanging out. They're playing soccer or whatever they're doing, but they're outside. A lot of us Americans were cooped up in our houses. And I mean, you drive through a neighborhood and you might see a couple kids playing, but most people are just inside, tucked away. Get outside, observe everything that takes place in the heaven, how they do not change their orbits, and the luminaries which are in heaven, how they all rise and set in order each in its season and transgress not against their appointed order. Behold the earth, look at it, and give heed to the things which take place on, upon, on it from first to last. How steadfast, that means unmoving, they don't change. How none of the things upon the earth change. But all the works of Elohim appear to you. Behold, the summer and winter, how the whole earth is filled with water, and dew and rain lie upon it. His creation was hijacked by lies. How would you feel? This is 2 Ezra 9, 14 through 22, and then 16, 54 through 62. I answered and said, I said before, and I will say now, and will say it again. There are more who perish than those who will be saved, as a wave is greater than a drop of water. He answered me and said, As is the field, so is the seed. And as are the flowers, so are the colors. And as is the work, so is the product. And as is the farmer, so is the threshing floor. For there was a time in this age when I was preparing for those who now exist, before the world was made for them to dwell in. And no one opposed me then, for no one existed. But now those who have been created in this world, which is supplied both with an unfailing table, that means supplies will never be exhausted, and an inexhaustible pasture, have become corrupt in their ways. So I considered my world, and behold, it was lost, and my earth, behold, it was in peril because of the devices of those who had come into it. And I saw and spared some with great difficulty, and saved for myself one grape out of a cluster, and one plant out of a great forest. So let the multitude perish, which has been born in vain, but let my grape and my plant be saved, because with much labor have I perfected them. Second Ezra 16, 54 through 62. Behold, Yahweh knows all the works of men. Let their, uh, I'm sorry, their imaginations and their thoughts and their hearts. 
And he said, Let the earth be made, and it was made. Let the heaven be made, and it was made. At his word, the stars were fixed, and he knows the number of the stars. It is he who searches the deep and its treasures, who has measured the sea and its contents, who has enclosed the sea in the midst of the waters, and by his word has suspended the earth over the water, who has spread out the heaven like an arch and founded upon the waters, who has put springs of water in the desert and pools on the tops of the mountains to send rivers from the heights of the water to the earth, who formed man and put a heart in the midst of his body and gave him breath and life and understanding and the spirit of almighty Elohim who made all things and searches out the hidden things in hidden places. Praise you. Um, let's go with... Yeah, let's finish up. So finish up on chapter one. Uh, I think we've spent, uh, yeah, an hour and 20 minutes on one chapter. Praise. Yeah, that's how we roll here. <clears throat> so in Genesis 131, it says, And Elohim saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So again, just a kind, friendly exhortation, just as a brother, not, a, not as someone who's over you or anything. But hey, maybe we should consider never again calling something that Yah made evil or wicked or not good or whatever it may be. So just something to think about. All right. So now let's go into chapter two. So the, the bulk of the study uh, it was in chapter one. Obviously, there's a lot more to cover, but really the, the meat and the crux, chapter one, so important. Um, the very basics and foundation of everything, because if our foundation isn't settled, then how's the rest of the how's the rest of our understanding going to be supplied? All right, let's read chapter two. Thus, so thus, so this is how the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, Elohim ended his work, which he had made and rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. Hallelujah for Shabbat. And Elohim blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it, he had rested from all his work, which Elohim created and made. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they are created. And the day that Yahweh Elohim made the earth and the heavens. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for Yahweh Elohim had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth, and watered the whole face of the ground. And Yahweh Elohim formed the man out of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living soul. And Yahweh Elohim planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made Yahweh Elohim to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pishon, that is which compasses the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. There is Delam and the Onyx Stone. And the name of the second river is Gihon. The same is it that compasses the whole land of Cush, or Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hidekil, that is it which goes toward the east of Ashur, or Assyria. And the fourth river is Parath. And Yahweh Elohim took man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to guard it. And Yahweh Elohim commanded he man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Yahweh said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. And out of the ground Yahweh formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and brought them unto the man to see what he would call them. And whatsoever the man called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And by the way, just real quick. Just in case I don't, in case I forget this later, some people say there's two different creation accounts. Like, has he created, and then he was like, nah, 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 and then he created again. I believe there's one creation story told from two different perspectives. We just got one perspective in chapter one, and I believe we're just getting a different perspective in chapter two. Just where I'm at. And the man gave names to all cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for the man, there is not found a helpmeet for him. And Yahweh Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which Yahweh Elohim had taken from man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. 
Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his woman, and were not ashamed. This is how, honestly, men, you men out there, what I have seen in the uh, plague in the Torah movement is men are like, they. we'll see in the next chapter, like, ha ha, Yah made me the ruler of this house. Submit to my authority, woman, or else you're in transgression of the Torah. Now, I'm obviously exaggerating a little bit, but which I shouldn't. But in practicality, that's actually what happens. And it's actually really, really sad. Um, we should be treating our wives just like they were literally taken out of our body, right? Just like how Eve was taken out of, out of Adam. Well, when we become married, we become one flesh. So as we'll read in Ephesians 5, we should treat them, um, of course, and nourish them up like they are our own flesh. So let's go back to uh, verses 2 through 3. Uh, this is talking all about the Shabbat, which if you're watching this, uh, you may actually you may not watch this on Shabbat. Uh, we're doing, obviously, this is airing on Shabbat. So a lot of you that are watching it live, hey, Shabbat Shalom. Um, and by the way, I forgot to do shofar earlier. My bad. It's like I almost forgot how to do this. Um, <clears throat> but the shofar is in the minivan right now, so that's not going to work out. Um, you guys want to do shofar real quick? All right, I'll do road shofar. Sorry, I can't join in the real shofar festivities, but get your shofars ready. And again, I'm sorry about this flickering of my, my camera. I don't know what to do with it. Like I said, I've, I've updated the program. I've changed the camera out. I've done everything I can. I don't know. Get your shofars ready. Praise yeah. Sorry, I ended it a little early. but So let's talk about the Shabbat. Uh, incredibly important. Um, let's talk about it. So again, Leviticus 23, 1 through 4, right here. Six days work shall be done, but the seventh day is the Shabbat of rest, a holy convocation. Ye shall do no work in it. It is the Shabbat of Yahuwah in all your dwellings. Praise be to Yah. Now, Exodus 31, 15 through And by the way, also it says, in your dwellings. Keep in mind, this word does not just mean house, right? Uh, we know in Acts uh, 15, they were they met every week at Shabbat. Luke chapter 4, Messiah went to um, the synagogue on Shabbat. So some people don't leave their houses because of this verse right here. But that's where Messiah is awesome, and we can just follow his lead. And on the Shabbat, he went for a walk with his disciples, picking grain on the Shabbat. Um, he went to the synagogue and uh, and taught and learned and, and, and read. Uh, so I don't believe that we're supposed to just hang out at the house. Exodus 31, 15 through 17 says, Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Shabbat of rest. Holy to Yahuwah, whosoever does any work in the Shabbat day, he will surely be put to death. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Shabbat to observe the Shabbat throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. So basically, forever. Now listen to this. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days, Yahuwah made the heaven and the earth. And on the seventh day, he was refreshed, rested and was refreshed. <clears throat> Would like to uh, also share this with you as well. It says it is a sign. So the Shabbat is the Hebrew word is ot, uh, which means a signal, uh, a distinguishing mark, a token, um, proof, if you will. Right? Proof. It's part of the proof or a sign or a mark on us that we are his. It's like, uh, not that I encourage branding your cattle because that's probably a lot of owie. There's probably a lot better ways to do it these days. But um, it's like how cattle is branded. Like, psh, you're mine. And now it's proof. There's visible proof. Well, maybe in the spiritual realm, there's visible proof. Maybe he literally does put a mark in our foreheads. And just to, also to show, share with you, the Shabbat is not the only sign. Uh, Deuteronomy 6 talks about uh, the whole Torah. When we do it, it's like a sign on our hand and our foreheads. Uh, when in Ezekiel 9, those who uh, were sighing and weeping and crying out for all the abominations done on the land, they were marked. Um, the blood of the Lamb is a mark uh, upon us. The Holy Spirit is a mark or a sign upon us. So all these together form, I believe, the true mark of Yahuwah. And I believe we're to have all of them. Uh, so obviously we probably don't need to talk a whole lot about Shabbat because most of you watching this probably are uh, pretty well convinced that, that we're supposed to keep the Sabbath day. Um, 
Uh, however, I think I have a few more. Right? Yeah, Ezekiel 20, verse 12. Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am Yahweh that sanctifies them. Verse 20. And hallow my Sabbaths, that they shall be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am Yahweh your Elohim. Mark 2, 27 through 28. He said, and he said unto them, the Sabbath was made for man like a gift, like here you go and not man for the Sabbath. He didn't create us to serve the Sabbath, but the Sabbath to be a blessing for us. Then he also says that the Son of Man is the master of the Sabbath. Matthew 24, 19 through 21. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give uh, suck in those days. But pray your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. So this is an end times context, and Messiah is saying that the Sabbath will still be in existence, of course. I, here's a great promise, Isaiah 56, 6 through 7. Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to Yahuwah, to serve him and to love the name of Yahuwah, to be his servants, everyone that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it and takes hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. Hallelujah. That's a great promise for keeping his Shabbat. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 7 here. Yahuwah formed man from the dust and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and became a living soul. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Second Ezra chapter 8. He answered me and said, The Most High made this world for the sake of many, but the world to come for the sake of few. But I tell you a parable, Ezra, just as when you ask the earth, it will tell you that it provides very much clay from which the earthenware is made, but only a little dust from which gold comes, so is the course of the present world. Many have been created, but few shall be saved. Messiah says the same thing. I answered and said, Then drink your fill of understanding, O my soul, and drink wisdom, O my heart. For not of your own will did you come into the world, and against your will you do depart. You do depart, For you have been given only a short time to live. O Yahuwah, who are over us, grant to your servant that we may, may pray before you and give us seed for our heart and cultivation of our understanding, so that fruit may be produced by which every mortal who bears the likeness of a human being may be able to live. For you alone do exist, and we are the work of your hands, as you, as you have declared. And because you do give life to the body which is now fashioned in the womb, and do, fa do furnish it with members, what you have created is preserved in fire and water and for nine months in the womb, which you have formed, which you have formed endures that your creation which has been created in it. But that which keeps and that which is kept shall both be kept by, by your keeping. And when the womb gives up again what has been created in it, you have commanded that from the members themselves, that is from the breasts, milk should be supplied, which is the fruit of the breasts, so that what has been fashioned may be nourished for a time, and afterwards you will guide him in your mercy. You have brought him up in your righteousness, and instructed him in your law, and reproved him in your wisdom. You will take away his life, for he is your creation, and you will make him live for he is your work. If then you will suddenly and quickly destroy him with so great who with so great labor was fashioned by your command, to what purpose was he made? Long story short, <clears throat> Ezra is just going over all the intricate details of man and how how complex uh, the creation was of creating man. And, and, and he's like, you'll just so quickly just destroy them? I don't understand. He answered me and said, some of the things you have spoken rightly. And this is, I'm sorry, 2 Ezra 8, 37 through 62. I don't know if we're going to read all of that. Uh, let's see. Gosh, we have so much more to go. Uh, let's see where we're at. Okay. He answered me and said, some things you have spoken rightly, and it will come to pass according to your words. For indeed, I will not concern myself about the fashioning of those who have sinned, or about their death, their judgment, or their destruction. But I will rejoice over the creation of the righteous, over their pilgrimage also, and their salvation, and their receiving their reward. As I have spoken, therefore, so it shall be. For just as the farmer sows many seeds upon the ground, and plants a multitude of seedlings, and yet not all that have been sown will come up in due season, and not all that were planted will take root, so also those who have been sown in the world will not be saved. So he's likening that, you know, just even though even though you sow all these seeds to plant plants, 
doesn't mean uh, they're all going to come up. Same thing with all the multitude of men. That doesn't mean all are going to be uh, saved. <clears throat> I answered and said, if I have found favor before you, let me speak. For if the farmer's seed does not come up because it has not received your rain in due season, or if it has been ruined by too much rain, it perishes. But man, who has been formed by your hands and has called your own image because he is made like you, and for whose sake you have formed all things, have you also made him like the farmer's seed? He's like, really? Can you really compare man to a seed? Really? No, O oh, master who are over us, but spare your people and have mercy on your inheritance, for you have mercy on your own creation. He answered me and said, Things that are present are for those who live now, and things that are future are for those who will live hereafter. For you come far short of being able to love my creation more than I love it. But you have often compared yourself to the unrighteous. Never do so. Even in this respect, you will be praiseworthy before the Most High, because you have humbled yourself as is becoming for you, and have not deemed yourself to be among the righteous in order to receive the greatest glory. For many miseries will affect those who inhabit the world in the last times, because they have walked in great pride. But think of your own case, and inquire concerning the glory of those who are like yourself, because, because it is for you that paradise is opened, the tree of life is planted, the age to come is prepared, plenty is provided, a city is built, rest is appointed, goodness is established, and wisdom perfected beforehand. The root of evil is sealed up from you, illness is banished from you, and death is hidden. Hell has fled and corruption has been forgotten. Sorrows have passed away, and in the end the treasure of immortality is made manifest. Therefore do not ask any more questions about the, about the multitude of those who perish, for they also received freedom. But they despised the Most High, and were contemptuous of His law, and forsook His ways. Moreover, they have even trampled upon His righteous ones, and said in their hearts that there is no Elohim though knowing full well that they must die. For just as things which I have predicted await you, so the thirst and torment which are prepared await them. For the Most High did not intend that men should be destroyed, but they themselves who were created have defiled the name of him who made them, and have been ungrateful to him who prepared life for them. Therefore my judgment is now drawing near. I have not shown this to all men, but only to you and a few like you. So... Uh, that's just I didn't ever realize how much of Second Ezra really uh, relates to the creation account. So let's go to uh, Second uh, Genesis two nine through ten, and he's talking about uh, the garden, of course, the tree of life in the midst of the garden, the tree of knowledge and evil and good. Um, and really, if you think about it, uh, also I'm sorry, also verse ten, river went out from Eden to water the garden. Um, and we look at the very last book, Revelation 22, verses 1 through 4. He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of Elohim and of the Lamb. And in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, there was a tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of Elohim and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. So literally, the whole story is getting back to the garden. Hallelujah. Uh, verse 15 in Genesis says, And Yahuwah Elohim took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to hang out and relax and sip my ties all day. No, no, no. Put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to guard it. He gave him a, a job, work to do. Work was established from the very beginning of creation. Men are appointed to work. Second Thessalonians 3.10 says, so For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. First Timothy 5.8 But if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel or unbeliever. It's another plague I've seen in the Torah um, community is people are doing what's called coming out of Babylon, which, from my understanding, is just is coming out of uh, false doctrine, false worship, uh, pagan customs and whatnot. doesn't mean stop working. There's a lot of people that have just been like, well, money's evil, so I can't work anymore and earn money. And then they lose their, their family loses everything, and then they rely on other people to support them. Um, brothers and sisters, this is not right. We are called to work. Uh, we are called to, to have our places of, of work, our duty, whatever it may be. But to just quit your jobs and just stop working. Um, and, you know, some people even justify, well, I pray all day and I read the scriptures all day. Uh, you still have to provide. 
uh, men, you still have to provide for yourself and for your families. So men were appointed to work. Yah gave us a job from the very beginning. Uh, I, I don't know what you think, uh, what any of us thought that, you know, um, the kingdom would be like or heaven would be like. I think a lot of people thought, you know, we'd just be like, you know, hanging out on clouds, you know, like sliding down like clouds slides and stuff. I don't know. But really, we're going to have work. We're still going to have jobs. Uh, and I don't know what that looks like in New Jerusalem, but I know that we're not going to just be sitting around and being idle because Yah hates that as well. Uh, verse 18 of Genesis, it says, Yahweh said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a help meet for him. I agree. Um, I, I love having my wife. Like, I don't like being alone. Even those, even the, in my younger years when I was in the, the Marine Corps, and I didn't like being alone. I didn't. I I agree with this statement. I know later on in the Gospels or in, in Paul's letters, Paul's Paul's encouraging people to be a single like him. Um, I can't get on board with that, me personally. Uh, and even Messiah says, uh, only those who, who can receive it, receive it. Um, I don't know. Uh, maybe it's just not the way I, I'm, I'm wired or built, but... Um, I don't think it's good for man to be alone. I will say, uh, I can understand. Maybe I can understand Paul what he was saying. Like, uh, because I do full time ministry, I, I often wonder. I mean, like, how much more could I have? Could I get done if it was just me? Well, probably a lot more. But I enjoy having my wife, my children, and the ministry. Um, so I don't know. Uh, again, that's why Messiah says, "Whoever can receive it will receive it." But the Torah says it's not good for man to be alone, and I agree. Which means, likewise, women, women too. Sorry, mm. I'm so sorry. I'm making all kinds of noises. <clears throat> My throat is scratchy. Um, I don't know. I should have my water here. I don't have it. Um. Okay. Let's see. I also want to talk about. See, verse twenty-four. I thought it's kind of interesting. Uh, he sees, he, of course, he sees Eve, and then it says also here, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and then shall be one flesh. Um, Brother Lee at our local congregation had an excellent teaching on, on family, on the husband and wife, marriage, children, and um, he pointed out something in this verse that I never caught. And the way Yah ordained us to live is to always be in family. Look at this. I, I never saw it before. So therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, as in he should be with his father and his mother until he gets married. Same thing with the woman. Uh, the Of course, the custom in the past was we see with um, like Abraham, he sends um, uh, Eliezer to go find a bride for uh, his son Isaac. And of course, they, they, they um, uh, made the arrangement. And uh, the, the wife left her father and mother. I think her father was dead at that point, and that's why her brother was in charge. But uh, nevertheless, um, and same thing with Isaac. Isaac was together with the family until they got married. But my point, the point Lee made, and the point that I'm trying to make as well, is that we're supposed to always be with family. This is how he designed it. Now, of course, there's always different scenarios. There's always uh, things that come up. But the standard... The way he made it to operate is to always be with family. So when you grow up, with your, you're with your mother and father. They rear you up. You honor them. They teach you the ways uh, so you'll never depart. Then you, as I'm talking from the man's perspective, then, of course, you get your wife. Now you started your own family. At, at no point were you without family. Family is important, um, especially the immediate family, but how much even more so in a spiritual sense our family, our, our, our spiritual family is just as important. That's why I'm a big proponent of encouraging people to find fellowship for the Shabbat, find fellowship for the feast days. Just doing it all on your own is hard. Now, if you have at least a family, your family can do things together. But still, even families, it gets lonely, you know. Uh, and so that's why uh, I'll tell you, um, I talked to Webmaster Dave. Um, he's uh, 
he's our, our brother in Torah who handles all of our online stuff. He's really going to look to uh, he's looking to revamp the, our site to really get the Fellowship Finder working. And there's other ministries uh, like 119 has a Fellowship Finder and so on and so forth. But that's why I really encourage uh, on these feast days, on the Shabbats, to get together with your family, your spiritual family, of course, your immediate family and your spiritual family. Um, but this is this is a design of you. And of course, uh, the devil tries to go after everything. We'll talk about that at the end, but if we especially attacks the family unit, when you can attack the family unit, then the children are vulnerable. When the children are vulnerable, then he can get to the children and turn the children over to satanic ways instead of, of course, scriptural ways. And of course, that's why we're in the big mess that we are in uh, as, as a whole uh, man, civilization, if you will. Okay. Um, I think we are done with chapter two. Let's move on to chapter three. <clears throat> Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which Yahweh Elohim had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, has Elohim said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, Elohim has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For Elohim knows that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as Elohim, knowing good and evil. So we can see the devil's tactics is to mix truth with lies. Because he says, you shall not surely die. That's a lie. Now, they weren't going to die immediately, but spiritually, or, you know, they, they were going to die, die eventually when they weren't created to die. But then he also spoke truth right here. If you eat, your eyes shall be opened and shall be as Elohim, knowing good and evil. So that's what the devil's uh, trickery. I'm sorry, I'm supposed to just read this through. <clears throat> and when the women saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her man with her and he did eat. And the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of Yahweh Elohim walking in the garden in the cool of the day and the man and his woman hid themselves from the presence of Yahweh Elohim amongst the trees of the garden. And Yahweh Elohim called unto Adam and said unto him, Where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree whereof I commanded you that you should not eat? And the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And Yahweh Elohim said unto the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And Yahweh Elohim said unto the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon your belly shall you go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. It shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In sorrow you shall bring forth children, and your desire shall be to your man, and he shall rule over you. And unto Adam he said, Because you have hearkened unto the voice of your woman, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. In sorrow shall you eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to you, and ye shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face shall you eat bread till you return unto the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and unto dust you shall return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And unto Adam also, and to his woman, did Yahweh make them coats of skins and clothe them. And Yahweh Elohim said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil. So again, <clears throat> remember, the, the devil spoke truth and lies. That's how he rolls. I'll talk about that more in a sec. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. So basically he's saying they need to get out because if he eats the tree from the tree of life, he will continue to live forever. Therefore, Yahweh Elohim sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life. So verse. Uh, let's go back to verse 5. It says here, um, this is the serpent, right? So this is the lies of the devil. For Elohim know, uh, 
knows in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as Elohim, knowing good and evil. So the temptation here was knowledge. Um, and the allure, it's like an allure for knowledge, like, ooh, look what you might have. Think of like mainstream education today. Uh, a lot of people are lured in by knowledge and I think are, uh, once again, led astray. And it's no wonder that the education system really is an indoctrination system. And I'm not taking a shot at any of you out there that have um, uh, bachelor's degrees, master's, doctorates. I'm not uh, getting going after you, but uh, hopefully, if you're watching this, hopefully you know that a lot of lies are told. Even if you just realize that uh, you that they tried to sell you lies on evolution and Darwinism and all these big bang, all these things that go against the creation story. Um, and so I just think it's interesting that knowledge, the pursuit of knowledge, has taken some people just so far away from, from the truth of Yah. And that's the very, the very allure from the very beginning. Think of like Freemasonry. The allure is knowledge, ascension, to, to, to grow wiser. Uh, and so that's not, a, that's, not a, that's not a bad desire, but the point is the word should be our fountain of, of knowledge and of understanding. Messiah, his words, all the scriptures is what should teach us knowledge and understanding. And of course, the Holy Spirit as well. But looking to what man or what Satan or what these pagan, and that's why uh, I learned early on. Uh, I started waking up like, uh, I don't know, 20, 2014, 2015 was like my research phase when I was just researching everything. And I quickly realized, I'm like, you know, I really don't, I don't care uh, about darkness. I don't care about how the enemy operates. I don't care about how voodoo works. I don't care about um, how witchcraft works. I don't need to know that stuff. Why, why would I read that? I don't, I don't need to read the Egyptian book of, of the dead <clears throat> to learn wisdom. I don't, I don't want any of that. I want to just soak up the scriptures. That's what's, what's going to teach. That's what's going to make me wise. That's what's going to make me uh, understanding. So if Adam and Eve truly wanted wisdom, they would just continue to just listen to Yah and what he said. And they would have been like, no, thanks. Yah said, don't do this. I'm not going to do it. That's wisdom. And so I believe that we can be searching for wisdom in some of the wrong places. And that's where I believe that his sheep get caught up in fences and get lost or get wandered off the path because they go and search for wisdom outside. And that's why I believe there's a lot of doctrines that just are crazy. Uh, that's the wrong word, Adam. Are just not of Yah. And that's why he's given us his word to know what's right and what's wrong, to know what's true and what's false. Just some thoughts. I thought this was, thought this was interesting. My wife and I, have, um, we've been talking about this verse here. Um, not, not verse 6. Um, maybe it's 16. Yeah. Yeah, unto the woman, he's uh, verse 16, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In sorrow shall you bring forth children, and your desire shall be to your man, and he shall rule over you. Um, it reminded me, actually, of this. First Timothy 13, or actually, I'm sorry, yeah, that was right. Verse 6 here talks about how, how Eve was deceived by the serpent. It reminded me of First Timothy 2. Verses 13 through 15 it says, For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness and sobriety. So I've always like wondered this verse, and it never made sense to me. I'm like, so wait, so women can only be saved if they bear children? That can't be right. You know, what if... There's a lot of extenuating circumstances. I'm sure some of you listening, some women uh, out there have not had ch children. And so, you know, is your salvation based off of childbearing? No. Um, I thought this was kind of interesting. And this is something that my wife and I, or my old wife has experienced. Um, uh, we're, we're having our first child together. Uh, she's six months pregnant. And uh, she, this is, which is a miracle because uh, when she was uh, younger in her teens, uh, she was forced to uh, not by her parents it's a long story but she was forced by the state to get a um the gardasil vaccine and it instantly almost killed her uh put her in, in complete liver failure instantly she has she's had cirrhosis of the liver for almost her entire life um in and out of hospitals surgeries removing gallbladder all kinds of stuff she was told a long time ago she would never have children 
However, um, we've just been continuing to, to pray and, and anoint her with oil, pray over her, and uh, praise Yeah, She's six months pregnant. And what's interesting is her liver numbers have never been better. It's almost as if she's healed. And so when we looked at the word saved, it is the same word like saved, like salvation. However, it says here also one of the uh, tran- one of the possible uses of the Greek word of sozo is here to save a suffering one from perishing, i.e. suffering one suffering from disease to make well, to heal, to restore health. So it's a mir- it's like a miracle um, that in childbearing, or she hasn't born the child yet, but in being pregnant, it's like healed her liver and it's like a miracle. And, you know, I guess maybe they're realizing some of the mechanics behind that today is that when you have a child, uh, you, I guess, share the cells, the healthy cells from that that child. And um, I guess it's kind of like we're not into stem cell stuff. We're not into that kind of stuff. But it's like a Yah's own way of doing stem cells where the cells from the baby are actually healing my wife's liver. And it's just absolutely amazing. So, um Again, kind of off topic, but again, this verse reminded me of First Timothy 2 and then reminded me of some of the, the um, research that we've done on this verse because it puzzled us. We, we just sat there and read First Timothy one day and we're like, what does that mean? And um, so, Yah is good, uh, brothers and sisters. Yah is good all the time and all the time. That's right. Yah is good. All right. Let's go to verse 11. It says here, uh, and who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree where have I commanded you that you should not eat? So it's like you wonder, some people ask, well, how did he even make a, uh, make something that, you know, can just transgress against him or, or not obey him? And that's honestly, that's what I, I really love about Yah is he's given man free will. He hasn't necessarily given animals free will. I guess they have free will in a sense, but they kind of just do what animals do. They don't really deviate like Bees just keep doing what bees do. Ants just keep on doing what ants do, right? Birds, they just, they just, all animals, all creation just does what it's supposed to. The sun, the moon, the stars, they don't transgress his orders. They keep doing what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, Enoch 5 says this, but and then, and then when it comes to man, he's given us free will. He's like, I'm not going to make you worship me. I'm not going to make you follow me. There's consequences, of course. And there's a lack of, of reward, of course, but I'll give you free will, just like he gave the angels free will. Chapter 5. Observe ye how the trees cover themselves with green leaves and bear fruit. Wherefore, give you heed and know with all regard to his works and recognize how he that lives forever has made them so. So give him credit. Like, thanks, yeah. You pull an apple from a tree and eat it. Thank you, yeah. Or you go to the store, too. Thank you, yeah. And all his works go on thus from year to year forever, and all the tasks which they accomplish for him, and their tasks change not, but according as Elohim has ordained, so it is done. Basically, he's like, this is how you're going to operate, and you operate, you know, as far as nature. And behold, how the sea and the rivers in like manner accomplish and change not their tasks from his commandments. But you, you have not been steadfast, nor done the commandments of Yahuwah. It's like, oh, man. When I read this early in my walk, I'm like, gosh. You're right. I haven't. You're right, Enoch. How'd you know? So it's basically like all nature does exactly what it's supposed to, but why aren't you, oh man? Why aren't you doing what you're supposed to be doing? And that's the call, of course. That's what Messiah came to do. He came to destroy the works of the devil, which is sin, to bring man back into a state of righteousness. He clean. He cleansed us, and now that he's cleansed us, we should stay clean by not defiling our garments, by walking in his ways. But he's given us free will. He's like, why didn't you, you, know, why didn't you do what I said? Verse 14, uh, when you actually look at uh, the Hebrew there, it's very possible that this is a dragon. And you look at, of course, the description. uh, Before the serpent was cursed, he didn't go upon his belly. Maybe he had legs. Maybe he had legs and wings. Either which way, they're removed. And now it slithers. It's very possible that snakes are the remnant of what dragons once, once used to be. I don't know. Um, there is, of course, uh, the story of Bell and the dragon, which is in the time of Daniel. Apparently, there was a dragon in Babylon uh, in those days, so I don't really know. Don't have the answer to that, but of course, just kind of interesting. Verse 15 is a big one. It says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. It shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now, many have said, um, that's not enough many, but quite a few people have said that there's two physical seed lines, the seed line of Satan and the seed line of, well, Yah or Elohim. 
uh, seed of, of Adam, if you will. I don't quite agree with that. Um, the reason being is because we, when we saw the angels come down and mate with women, they created these giants. Uh, there's no indication that, that um, uh, Cain was a giant uh, whatsoever. Uh, and keep in mind also, at this point, there's really there's no seed at this point. Uh, I think this is a spiritual seed of a seed of obedience, a seed of disobedience. Um, let's take a look at Second Ezra seven one twenty seven through one thirty one. He said he answered and said, "This is the meaning of the contest or the battle which every man who is born on earth shall wage. That if he is defeated, he shall suffer what you have said, death, torment. But if he is victorious, he shall receive what I have said, everlasting life." For this is the way of which Moses, while he was alive, spoke to the people, saying, Choose for yourself life that you may live. But they did not believe him, or the prophets after him, or even myself who have spoken to them. Therefore there shall not be grief at their destruction, so much as joy over those whom salvation is assured. It's it's black and white. There's no gray area. It's yes or no. It's saved or damned. It's uh, life or death. It's sweet or bitter. Uh, it's blessing or cursing. There's no in-between. 1 John 3, 7 through 10, Little children, let no one deceive you. He who does right is righteous, as he is righteous. He who commits sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The reason the Son of Elohim appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of Elohim commits sin, for Elohim's nature abides in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of Elohim. That doesn't mean that you can't physically sin, but you're the ruach in you, the, the mentality you have, the heart you have, the inner being that you have won't let you sin. Like, no, I won't sin. I won't do the wrong thing. I'm going to do what's right. By this it may see be seen who are the children of Elohim and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not do right is not of Elohim or righteousness nor he who does not love his brother. So those of you that are doing all the check marks of the Torah, but hate your f uh, fellow brother, you're the devil. That's what it says, not me. John 8:37 through 44. I know that you are descendants of Abraham. He's talking to the, uh, he's talking to the Pharisees here, and he's acknowledging you are descendants of Abraham. Yet you seek to kill me, because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. But wait a minute. He just said Abraham was their father. They answered him, Abraham's our father. Like, what are you talking about? You just acknowledge that Abraham's our father. Yahushua said to them, if, if you were Abraham's children, you would do what Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from Elohim. This is not what Abraham did. You do what your father did. They said, they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, even Elohim. Yehusha said to them, If Elohim were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded and came forth from Elohim. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You were of your father, the devil, and you and your will is to do your father's desire. So pause real quick. He acknowledged in a physical sense that they're descendants of Abraham. However, he said their father is the devil because of their actions. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks according to his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. That's another reason why I don't uh, believe in the, the serpent seed. Revelation 12, 17, Then the dragon was angry with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of Elohim and bear the testimony to Yahusha. Hallelujah. All right. Uh, Genesis 3.16, where it says here, um, and your desire shall be to your husband and he shall rule over you. So he's giving the man the authority in the home. But let's talk, let's look at uh, Ephesians 5 in, in the context of ruling over. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the master. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Messiah is the head of the church or the assembly, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the assembly is subject unto Messiah, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Messiah also loved the assembly and gave himself for it. That's the kind of mentality that we should have. We should want to um, be willing to die uh, for our spouses, just straight up. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious assembly, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. 
so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. So those of you that are out there like, I'm Torah man, hear me roar, relax. Men ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself. For no man, and when I say relax, I mean don't be, <clears throat> don't be that obnoxious man who rules with cruel harshness in his house. Sought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the master of the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, and should be joined to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This also reminds me of, uh, I think it's First Peter, uh, not per, First Peter 3. Likewise, uh, 1 Peter 3, 7, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the gra grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. So, men, if you've been ruling your household with, with um, harshness, with fierceness, without mercy and compassion, think about the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, long-suffering, self-control, kindness. How about, how about, exuding those or performing those with your closest neighbor your wife and wife your husband is your closest neighbor husband your wife is your closest neighbor but it says here peter says that if we don't honor the wife and dwell with them to knowledge giving honor to the wife as the weaker vessel as in being patient because that's what it says not me that your prayers be not hindered so i wonder if you're not walking in that is that possibly why your prayers may not have been answered Um, let's see. Verse 19. In the sweat of your face shall you eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and unto dust shall you return. Another second Ezra, uh, 6 through 14. Uh, I'm sorry, chapter 7, 6 through 14. Another example. There is a city built and set on a plain, and it is full of all good things, New Jerusalem. But the entrance to it is narrow and set in a precipitous place so that there is fire on the right hand and deep water on the left. And there is only one path lying between them, that is, between the fire and the water, so that only one man can walk upon that path. If now that city is given to a man for an inheritance, how will the heir receive his inheritance unless he passes through the danger set before him? I said, he cannot master. And he said to me, so also is Israel's portion. For I made the world for their sake. And when Adam transgressed my statutes, what had been made was judged. And so the entrances of this world were made narrow and sorrowful and toilsome. They are few and evil, full of dangers and involved in great hardships. So it's since because of the fall, our life, the, the path, the walk is ordained to be hard. And that's how it's supposed to be. And this is how he tests us and proves us to see what's in our heart, whether we would keep his commandments or not. It's a big test. It's a big application of, of being, in his, uh, being in his house for the rest of our life. And our, our life is part of the application process. It's not just declaring that Messiah is our Messiah and that he died on a cross and was buried and rose again on the third day. That's just the very beginning for a lot of us. That was the beginning for me when I believe that. But it, the, your whole walk, your whole life, you got to prove yourself. But the entrances of the greater world are broad and safe and really yield the fruit of immortality. After, of course, you go through the narrow part. Therefore, unless the living pass through the difficult and vain experiences, they can never receive those things that have been reserved for them. So it is our portion to go through these hardships. So again, in the sweat of your face shall you eat bread. It's going to be hard. Life is going to be hard. It's not going to be easy. It's going to require work and dedication and perseverance. Uh, <clears throat> so again, we saw this in Revelation. Uh, this is Genesis 3, uh, 322. And Yahweh Elohim said, Behold, a man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. And that's what will happen when we return to the garden in Revelation 22. Praise Yah. So, <clears throat> let's go to chapter 4. <clears throat> okay, chapter 4. And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have gotten a man from Yahuwah. And she again bore his brother Abel, 
And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto Yahuwah. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. And Yahuwah had respect unto Abel in his offering, but unto Cain and his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And Yahuwah said unto Cain, Why are you wroth? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, as in do what's right, shall you not be accepted? That almost reminds me of the application process to be in his community forever. If you do well, shall you not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin lies at the door. And unto you shall be his desire, and you shall rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass that when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And Yahweh said unto Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And he said, I know not. Am I to guard my brother? Or am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries unto me from the ground. And now are you cursed from the earth, which has opened her mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. <clears throat> when you tell the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto you her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shall you be in the earth. And Cain said unto El Yahuwah, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from your face shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And it shall come to pass that everyone that finds me shall slay me. And Yahweh said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slays Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And Yahweh set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. And Cain went out from the presence of Yahuwah and dwelt in the land of Nod on the, eastern, on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his woman, and she conceived and bore Hanok. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Hanok. And unto Hanok was born Irad, and Irad be begat Mechuyael, and Mechuyael begat Methusael, and Methusael begat Lamech. And Lamech took unto him two wives, the name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other was Zillah. And Ada bore Yaval, he was the father of such as dwell in tents, and of such as have cattle. And his brother's name was Yuval, he was the father of all of such as handled the harp and the organ. And Zillah, she also bore Tubal Cain, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Naama. And Lamech said unto his woman, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, ye women of Lamech, hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding, and a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. And Adam knew his woman again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For Elohim sh said she has appointed me another seed instead of Havil, whom Cain slew. And unto Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enosh. Then began men to call upon the name of Yahuwah. <clears throat> so uh, let's go to verse 7. It says, Yahuwah said unto Cain, Why are you mad, and why is your countenance fallen? Uh, and then it says, If you do well, shall you not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin lies at the door, and unto you shall be his desire. So sin's going to be looking for you, but you shall rule over him. That's how it's to be. That's at least how I read it. I know there's different interpretations of this. So basically, rule or be ruled. Rule over sin as in subdue it and get it out of your life, or it will rule over you. Just like what happens with weeds in, in your garden. If you don't subdue it, it will eventually take over your garden. Uh, for now, Jasher 1, 15 through 16, it says here, And it was at the expiration of a few years that they brought an approximating offering to Yahuwah, and Cain brought from the fruit of the ground, and Abel brought from the firstlings of his flock from the fat thereof. And Elohim turned and inclined to Abel and his offering, and a fire came down from Yahuwah from heaven and consumed it. And unto Cain and his offering, Yahuwah did not turn, and he did not incline to it, for he had brought from the inferior fruit of the ground before Yahuwah. And Cain was jealous against his brother Abel on account of this, and he sought a pretext to slay him. So this is so uh, the first murder was born out of jealousy or envy. Uh, and uh, really for a lack of love for Yah. Um, he bought, and he's like, I'll give you the, I'll give you the yucky, yucky radishes. I'll keep the good ones for me or whatever it was, obviously. <clears throat> uh, verse eight in Genesis, Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up and slew Abel, his, uh, his brother. So the death of Abel, let's talk about that. So we're going back to Jasher 
We're going to be at 17, well, um, chapter 1, verse 17, and we'll read through 26. Um, and sometime after, Cain and Abel, his brother, went one day into the field to do their work. And they were both in the field, Cain tilling and plowing his ground, and Abel feeding his flock. And the flock passed that part which Abel had plowed in the ground, and it sorely grieved Cain on this account. And Cain approached his brother Abel in anger, and he said unto him, What is there between me and you, that you come to dwell and bring your flock to feed in my land? And Abel answered his brother Cain and said to him, What is there between me and you, that you shall eat the flesh of my flock and clothe yourself with their wool? And now therefore... Put off the wool of my sheep with which you have clothed yourself and repay me for their fruit, for their fruit and flesh, which you have eaten. And when you shall have done this, I will then go from your land, as you have said. And Cain said to his brother Abel, surely if I slay you this day, who will require your blood from me? And Abel answered Cain, saying, surely Elohim, who has made us on the earth, he will, he will avenge my cause and he will require my blood from you should you slay me. For Yahuwah is the judge and arbiter, and it is he who will requite man according to his evil, and the wicked man according to the wickedness that he may do upon the earth. And now, if you should slay me here, surely Elohim knows your secret views, and will judge you for the evil which you did declare to do unto me this day. And when Cain heard the words which Abel his brother had spoken, behold, the anger of Cain was kindled against his brother Abel for declaring this thing. And Cain hastened and rose up and took the iron part of his plowing instrument, with which he suddenly smote his brother and slew him. And Cain spilt the blood of his brother Abel upon the earth, and the blood of Abel streamed upon the earth before the flock. And after this Cain repented, having slain his brother, and he was sadly grieved, and he wept over him, and it vexed him exceedingly. Uh, let's go to the Testament of Simeon. We're going to read uh, verses or chapter 1, verses 7 through 20. And with this, we'll see a very similar thing with Simeon and Joseph, all stemming from envy or jealousy of one another, which <clears throat> ought to be completely out of our assemblies, out of our minds, out of our hearts. Again, this is Simeon, um, brother of Joseph. For in the time of my youth, I was jealous in many things of Joseph because my father loved him beyond all. And I set my mind against him to destroy him because the prince of deceit sent forth the spirit of jealousy and blinded my mind so that I regarded him not as a brother, nor did I spare even Jacob, my father. But his Elohim and the Elohim of his father sent forth his angel and delivered him out of my hands. For when I went to Shechem to bring ointment for the flocks and Reuben to Dotham, where were our necessaries and all of our stores, Judah, my brother, sold him to the Ishmaelites. And when Reuben heard these things, he was grieved, for he wished to restore him to his father. But on hearing this, I was exceedingly wroth against Judah, and that I let him go away alive, and that he let him go away alive. And for five months I continued wrathful against him. But Yahweh restrained me and withheld from me the power of my hands, for my right hand was half withered for seven days. And I knew, my children, that because of Joseph this had befallen me. And I repented and wept, and I besought Yahweh Elohim that my hand might be restored, and that I might not might hold aloof from all pollution and envy from all folly. For I knew that I had devised an evil thing before Yahuwah and Jacob my father on account of Joseph my brother, in that I envied him. And this is very similar to what Cain did with Abel. And now, my children, hearken unto me, and beware of the spirit of deceit and envy. For envy rules over the whole mind of a man, and suffers him neither to eat nor drink, nor to do any good thing. But it ever suggests to him to destroy him that he envies. So it's like this this envy, this spirit, makes you want to destroy this person. <clears throat> and so long as he that is envied flourishes, he that envies faded away. So, uh, so it, let's say person A envies person B. As long as person B continues to be prosperous and flourish, person A fades away, withers away, and fades away. Two years, therefore, I afflicted my soul with fasting in the fear of Yahuwah. I'm sure it wasn't two years, I'm sure it was different types of fasts or whatever, intervals. And I learned that deliverance from envy comes by the fear of Yahuwah. For if a man flee to Yahuwah, the evil spirit runs away from him and his mind is lightened. And henceforward he sympathizes with him who he envied and forgives those who are hostile to him and so ceases from the envy. So just in case any of you ever suffer with jealousy or envy, it is something that has to be rooted out absolutely uh, right away. No delay. James three thirteen through 18 Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, spiritual, demonic. 
For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Yah likes peace. Again, application process to his, his kingdom. Do you think he wants a bunch of troublemakers, a bunch of uh, deceivers, a bunch of division causers, a bunch of railers, accusers of brethren, envious people, jealous people? No. That's why in Galatians 5, Paul says all the works of the flesh, people who do these things, uh, jealousy, envy, murder, wrath, sedition, uh, strife, debaters, uh, it says they won't they want to enter, enter the kingdom of heaven. 1 John 3.12, we should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. And that made him envious, of course. <clears throat> All right, uh, here in verse 10 and 11, we, talk, we, it sees, we see that the voice of Abel's blood cries from the ground. So what is that? Leviticus 17, 14 says, For it is the life of all flesh. The blood of it is for the life thereof. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, You shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh, for the life of all flesh is in the blood. So blood is living, right? Whosoever eats it shall be cut off. Why do you think the, the people who serve Satan eat and drink blood? Well, there's a lot of people in the world that eat blood just because it's tradition. But there's literally people out there that drink blood. Why do you think it preserves their life in some way? And it doesn't do it forever, but it might make an 80-year-old person live to 90. I don't know what that. What, I don't know what the ratios are, but they literally consume blood. <clears throat> Why do you think Hollywood romanticizes blood i think about like the twilight series and whole generation of mostly girls uh, were fascinated by blood drinkers like i mean seriously everything anything the devil can do to get the people to do to to, to hate yahuwah's ways or want it or love the opposite of yahuwah's ways he'll do it genesis 9 4 but the flesh with the life thereof which is the blood thereof you shall not eat it's living I'm sure after a certain amount of time it dies, but it doesn't live forever. But I don't know how that works. I'm, I'm not a scientist. But anyways, they, the, 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 the evil ones, they invert everything. Everything that Yah stands for, they want to create a people that hate it. I mean, why do you think the whole LGB, so on and so forth is created? It's in complete opposition to Yah. Why do you think food is, is seedless? Um, why do you think food is genetically modified? Why do you think uh, they spray the things in the air? They just want to literally turn everything upside down. And that's why we spent so much time on the creation story because, I mean, that is attacked. Completely attacked. Anyways. Um, those of you, I'm not going to go through this article, but those of you that aren't aware, uh, uh, there's a lot of um, a lot of dishes out there uh, that people eat that contain blood, and it's just completely disgusting. Uh, I'm not going to look at it, but if you want to read that, you can read it. Uh, if you, a lot of Americans don't, but a lot of uh, European and Asian countries, um, there's a lot of dishes made with blood. You may want to check into that because we are called to stay away. Um, let's see. Uh, this is a, a, this is Enoch 98. Uh, it says, Woe to you, you obstinate of heart who work wickedness and eat blood. Whence have you good things to eat and drink and to be filled? From all the good things which Yahweh the Most High has placed in the buns on the earth. Therefore you shall have no peace. So it's like he's like, and like we read earlier in Genesis 1, uh, or actually we read it in Second Address that he made all these varied flavors for the appetite, for the taste. He's like, I've made all these wonderful things, and why do you have to go and eat blood? It's the one thing I said don't eat. The the fruit of the tree in the garden, it's the one thing I said I don't eat. Literally the whole story, brothers and sisters, has been, hey, man, keep my commandments. And what does the devil always do? Hey, no, you don't really have to. What's well, the same thing today? Messiah came uh, so that we don't have to do the commandments anymore. That's a lie from the devil that the church is just, perpetrate because it's tradition and they carry it on uh, Enoch 22 um, this is a, a, a Enoch is taken on a journey he sees um, he sees the um, 
basically he sees Sheol. Sheol is where uh, the dead rest until the resurrection. Verse 5 says, I saw the spirits of the children of men who were dead, and their voice went forth to heaven and made suit. Then I asked Raphael, the angel who was with me, and said to him, This spirit, whose is it whose voice goes forth and makes suit? And he answered me, saying, This is the spirit which went forth from Abel, whom his brother Cain slew. And he makes suit against him till his seed is destroyed from the face of the earth, and his seed is annihilated from amongst the seed of men. And I don't think this is talking about just his lineage, but the, those who are all um, wicked, the, the wicked seed line, spiritual. <coughs> uh, Genesis 4.15 Yahweh said to him, Therefore, whoever slays Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And Yahweh set a mark upon Cain. What kind of mark? There's been a lot of speculation what that mark is. Uh, I don't know that I have the answer, but um, this is an interesting uh, passage here. It's called the Psalms of Solomon, part of the Septuagint, um, the Apocrypha, the Septuagint. It says, a psalm, This is 15, a Psalm of Solomon with song. When I was persecuted, I called on Yahweh's name. I hoped for the help of Jacob's Elohim, and I was saved. For you, O Elohim, are the hope and refuge of the poor. For who, O Elohim, is strong if not to praise you in truth? And why is a man powerful if not to sing in praise to your name? A new psalm with song, with happy heart, with a happy heart, the fruit of the lips with a tuned instrument of the tongue, the first fruits of the lips from a holy and right, righteous heart. The one who does these things will never stagger from evil. The flame of fire and anger against the wrongdoers will not touch him. When it goes out from Yahweh's presence against sinners to destroy every confidence of the sinners. Listen to this. For Elohim's mark is on the righteous for salvation. Protecting mark. Famine and sword and death will be far from the righteous, for they will flee from the saints like those pursued by war. Remember in Revelation, don't touch anyone that has my mark. But they will pursue sinners and overtake them, for those who act lawlessly will not escape Yahweh's judgment, just like Cain. For they will be overtaken as by experts in war, because the mark of destruction is on their forehead. Whoa. Whoa. Testament of Benjamin, um, chapter 1, verse 37. <clears throat> The good mind has not two tongues of blessing, of cursing, of contumely and of honor, of sorrow and of joy, of quietness and confusion, of hypocrisy and truth, of poverty and wealth, but it has one disposition, uncorrupt and pure concerning all men. It has no double sight nor double hearing, for in everything which he does or speaks or sees, he knows that Yahweh looks on his soul and cleanses his mind that he may not be condemned by men as well as by Elohim. And in like manner, the works of Belial are twofold, and there is no singleness in them. Therefore, my children, I tell you, flee the malice of Belial. Belial is Satan, for he gives a sword to them that obey him. And the sword is the mother of seven evils. First, the mind conceives through Belial, and first, there is bloodshed. Secondly, ruin. Third, tribulation. Fourth, exile. Fifth, dearth. Sixth, panic. Seventh, destruction. Therefore was Cain also delivered over to seven vengeances by Elohim. For in every hundred years, Yahweh brought one plague upon him. And when he was two hundred years old, he began to suffer. And in nine hundredth year, he was destroyed. For on account of Abel, his brother, with all the evils, he was a judged. But Lamech was seventy times seven. Because forever those who are like Cain in envy and hatred of brethren shall be punished with the same judgment. Wow. Um, let's see, verse 21. All right, so, so, uh, actually, no, we're good on that. Uh, let's see. Let's go to verse 24. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. Let's go to where this is located at. This is in Jasher chapter 2, verses 26 through 36 says, and Lamech was old and advanced in years, and his eyes were dim that he could not see. And Tubal Cain, his son, was leading him, and it was one day that Lamech went to the field, and Tubal Cain, his son, was with him. And whilst they were walking in the field, Cain, the son of Adam, advanced towards them. For Lamech was very old and could not see much, and Tubal Cain, his son, was very young. And Tubal Cain told his father to draw his bow, and with the arrows he smote Cain, who was yet far off, and slew him. For he appeared to them to be an animal. There's a lot of speculation of what exactly was going on here. And the arrows entered Cain's body, although he was distant from them, and he fell to the ground and died. 
And Yahweh requited Cain's evil according to his wickedness, which he had done to his brother Abel, according to the word of Yahweh which he had spoken. And it came to pass, <clears throat> when Cain had died, that Lamech and Tubal went to see the animal which they had slain. And they saw, and behold, Cain, their grandfather, was fallen dead upon the earth. And Lamech was very much grieved at having done this. And in clapping his hands together, he struck his son and caused his death. I don't know what that looked like. And the wives of Lamech heard what Lamech had done, and they sought to kill him. And the wives of Lamech hated him from that day, because he slew Cain and Tubal Cain. And the wives of Lamech separated from him and would not hearken to him in those days. And Lamech came to his wives, and he pressed them to listen to him about this matter. And he said to his wives, Adah and Zillah, Hear my voice, O wives of Lamech, and attend to my words. For now you have imagined and said that I slew a man with my wounds and a child with my stripes for their having done no violence. But surely know that I am old and gray-headed and that my eyes are heavy through age and I did this thing unknowingly. And the wives of Lamech listened to him in this matter and they returned to him with their advice of their father Adam. But they bore no children to him from that time, knowing that Elohim's anger was increasing in those days against the sons of men to destroy them from the waters of flood for their evil doings. Um, with that, let's see, um, we're done. Let's go to chapter five. I say we're done. We're done with chapter four. We got, uh, chapter five and a little bit of six left. I'm sorry about this flickery thing. I don't know what to do about it. Would you guys please pray for my computer or I, I don't, this flickering thing you see, I, I've tried to do everything I can to fix this. I've updated, I've reinstalled, I've got a new camera. Um, I think my computer might be doing doing this somehow, but I'm so sorry. That's probably a really big distraction. It's distracting me looking at it right now. All right, Genesis 5. So maybe just don't even look at me. Maybe you'll just turn me off for the rest of... I don't know. Here, I don't know. All right, let's just go. Sorry. This is the Sefer, the book of the generations of Adam, in the day that Elohim created man, in the likeness of Elohim made he him. Male and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam, in the day when they were created. And Adam lived a hundred and thirty years, and he begot a son in his own likeness, after his image, and called his name Seth. And the days of Adam, after he had begotten Seth, were eight hundred years, and he begat sons and daughters. And all the days that Adam lived were nine hundred and thirty years, and he died. And Seth lived a hundred and five years, and begot Enosh. And Seth lived after he begot Enosh 870 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Seth were 912 years and he died. And Enosh lived 90 years and begot Canaan. And Enosh lived after he begot Canaan 815 years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Enosh were 905 years and he died. And Canaan lived 70 years and begot Mahalalel. And Canaan lived after he begot Mahalalel 840 years and he begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Canaan were nine hundred and ten years, and he died. And Mahalalel lived sixty and five years, and begot Yered. And Mahalalel lived after he begot Yered eight hundred and thirty years, and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Mahalalel were eight hundred and ninety and five years, and he died. And Yered lived a hundred and sixty and two years, and begot Hanok. And Yered lived after he begot Hanok eight hundred and uh, eight hundred years, and begot sons and daughters. All the days of Yered were nine hundred and sixty and two years, and he died. And Hanok lived 365 years and begot, I'm sorry, and Hanok lived 60 and 5 years and begot Methuselah. And Hanok walked with Elohim after he begot Methuselah 300 years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Hanok were 360 and 5 years. And Hanok walked with Elohim and he was not, for Elohim took him. And Methuselah lived 180 and 7 years and begot Lamech. And Methuselah lived after he begot Lamech seven hundred and eighty and two years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Methuselah were nine hundred and sixty and nine years, and he died. And Lamech lived a hundred and eighty and two years and begot a son. And he called his name Noah, saying, The same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which Yahweh had cursed. And Lamech lived after he begot Noah five hundred and ninety and five years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Lamech were seven hundred and seventy and seven years, and he died. And Noah was five hundred years old, and Noah begot Shem, Ham, and Yepheth. All right, so chapter five. Um, I just want to go back to the very beginning here. <clears throat> and so once again, uh, we have to stand up for what's true. Yah created, Yahusha created male and female. That's it. He didn't create him, they, them, binary, uh, mixing the two. He didn't mess up anyone at creation 
when he created them. If he made them male, they're male. If he made them female, they're female. What the world is teaching now, I mean, it's like, it's like, wow, if the world wasn't confusing enough, now we're giving uh, five-year-olds, seven-year-olds the opportunity to change their uh, gender. Unbelievable, brothers and sisters. We have got to stand up for what this is. And this is the very basics that Satan likes to attack. Let's just, let's, let's, uh, let's um, recap just in this first Torah portion what uh, Satan has, has done. He has changed the story of the creation of the earth, uh, the, the change the story of uh, creation of animals and man. He's destroying and continues to destroy the family unit. Um, and even, I don't, I don't watch TV or anything, but even like five or six years ago, um, you know, five or six years ago, I, I saw that just from researching, I, I've stopped watching TV a lot longer than that, but that like, I saw like the TV show like Modern Family or something like that. Modern Family, is that right? It's like everything is completely out of order. The 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 woman provides the the man stays home. Uh, homosexuality is cool. Matter of fact, they make the homosexual people the most the most interesting and entertaining people in the whole show. It's like completely just changing the whole order of things, uh, destroying the family unit, uh, destroying uh, genders and, and creating gender confusion, uh, and it's just unbelievable. Uh, teaching that men with men are okay and women or with women are okay and uh, all sorts of confusion. And this is just the very basics of life uh, that are just being flipped upside down. Uh, other than that, there's not a whole lot I want to talk about in this chapter except for one cool thing, just showing another part of Yah's just mighty hand and that he knew the beginning from the end. He knew everything. So uh, I'll leave this link if you want to read everything here, but just kind of give you a quick idea. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the first 10 men from Adam, Seth, Enosh, Canaan, all the way down to uh, Noah, if you look at the definition of their name, um, it actually spells out the gospel with the first 10 names, the first righteous 10 men, of course, uh, the righteous seed line, if you will. Uh, so Adam's name means man. So Seth means appointed, uh, and it goes on. And so if we look at all the na- the ne- the meanings of the name, so Adam means man, Seth means appointed, Enosh is mortal, Canaan is sorrow, Mahalalel is the blessed Elohim, Jared means, means shall come down, Enoch means teaching, Methuselah means his death shall bring, Lamech means the despairing, Noah means rest or comfort. So check this out. This is the gospel in the first 10 names. Man is appointed mortal, mortal sorrow, but the blessed Elohim shall come down teaching that his death shall bring the despairing rest. Come on. Come on. It's not by accident. It's not by coincidence. Our Heavenly Father is awesome in all his ways and all his works. Hallelujah. Actually, what's interesting, we won't we'll do it today, but uh, if you take a look at the the set the order of the seven assemblies in Revelation chapters two through three, it tells a story. If you look at the actual specific orders of the names of the twelve tribes in Revelation, the hundred forty four thousand, it tells a story. It's amazing. Anytime you see a group of names, uh, and, and you have some extra time, look up each definition of the name, and then put it. And it usually tells a story. It's amazing. Okay, for the last section, we're just going to be reading Genesis six one through eight. And then a couple things to talk about, and we're going to finish this Torah portion. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of Elohim saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them women of all which they chose. And Yahweh said, My ruach shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were Nephilim in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of Elohim came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, the same became giants, which were of ancient times, men of infamy. And Yahweh saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And Yahweh repented that he had made men on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And Yahweh said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for I repent that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of Yahweh. So let's talk about it. So this <clears throat> this is the um, this is the, 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 the fallen angels coming down, mating with women. Because if you look at the, the, sons, the sons of Elohim, um, let's take a look at it. Uh, the sons of Elohim. 
and you look at it, it's the same term we see in Job. Now there was a day when the sons of Elohim came to present themselves before Yahuwah, and Satan came also among them. And this is a heavenly discussion. Yah is discussing with these sons of Elohim. These sons of Elohim are angels. Um, verse 3, it says, My Ruach shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh, and his days shall be 120 years. Some people said, well, that's 120 jubilees. Um, you know, maybe, maybe not. Um, <clears throat> there's a couple of verses I'd like to share in regards to that. We'll come back to that. Uh, let's see, I have here in Septuagint, read 6.3. And Yahweh Elohim said, "My spirit shall not certainly remain among these men for these men forever, because they are flesh. But their days shall be 120 years." Um, in the book of Jasher, I'm pretty sure we have the references for Jasher. Uh, we'll see that uh, Yah gave man 120 years to repent, and then if they didn't repent within 120 years, He was going to destroy everybody with the flood. Uh, so as for uh, the Watchers, whatnot, uh, let's take a look at uh, Enoch chapter six. It says, it came to pass when the children of men had multiplied and in those days were born unto them the beautiful, beautiful and comely daughters and the angels, the children of heaven, it specifies, saw and lusted after them and said one to another, come, let us choose us wives from among the children of men and beget us children. And Samyaza, who was their leader, said unto them, I fear you will not agree, indeed agree to do this deed and I alone shall have to pay for the penalty of a great sin. And they all answered and hit to him and said, Let us all swear an oath and bind ourselves by mutual imprecations, curses, not to abandon this plan, but to do this thing. Then swear they all together and bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it. And they were all two hundred who descended in the days of Jared on the summit of Mount Hermon. And they called it Mount Hermon because they had sworn and bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it. And these are the names of their leaders. Uh, we're not even going to read them. Uh, and all this is chapter 7 of Enoch and all others together with them took of themselves wives and each chose for himself one and they began to go into, into them and to defile themselves with them and they taught them charms and enchantments and the cutting of roots and made them acquainted with plants and they became pregnant and they bare great giants whose height was 3,000 L's who consumed all the acquisitions of men and when men could no longer sustain them the giants turned against them and devoured mankind and they began to sin against birds and beasts and reptiles and fish and to devour one another's flesh and to drink the blood then the earth laid accusation against the lawless ones uh, chapter 8 and Azazel taught men to make swords and knives and shields and breastplates and made known to them the metals of the earth and the art of working them and bracelets and ornaments and the use of antimony and the beautifying of the eyelids and all kinds of costly stones and all coloring tinctures and there arose much godlessness and they committed fornication and they were led astray and became corrupt in all their ways Semyaza taught enchantments and root cuttings Armaros the resolving of enchantments Barakihal taught astrology Kokabel, the constellations, Ezekiel, the knowledge of the clouds, Arakiel, the signs of the earth, Shamsiel, the signs of the sun, and Sariel, the course of the moon. This is the, this is the uh, origin of the knowledge that NASA and world governments have to know when these eclipses are coming before they do. And as men perished, they cried, and their cry went up to heaven. <clears throat> um, let's see. Uh, this is chapter 9. I'm just going to read one, one, one quick one verse. Verse 6, you see what Azazel has done, who has taught all unrighteousness on earth and revealed the eternal secrets which were preserved in heaven, which men were striving to learn. Mm. <clears throat> Any case. So uh, there's a lot more. Uh, um, Enoch 6 through 10, actually 6 through 15 really tells the whole, uh, the doings of the watchers. Basically, they came down, they mated with women, they created these giants. These giants were eating up everything, and then they started eating people, and then they uh, mixed the DNA with, with animals, I, I believe, creating these dinosaurs and all sorts of um, uh, massive creatures. Um, and it's interesting, um, where was it? Where were we? My wife and I were at uh, the Petrified Forest in Arizona, and there's like inscribings on a rock, and there's like this big bird that's like 10 times bigger than people that are eating people. And I, I just wonder, you know, if that's part of uh, what we were reading here. Uh, as far as Enoch, uh, you know, there's, there's a couple witnesses. Um, actually, we'll go to... In chapter 10, 
It says here, verse 4, and again, Yahweh said to Raphael, Bind Azazel hand and foot, and cast him into the, dark, the darkness, and make an opening in the desert, which is in Dudael, and cast him therein, and place upon him rough and jagged rocks, and cover him with darkness, and let him bide there forever and ever, and cover his face until he does not see light. And on the day of the great judgment, he shall be cast into the fire. And then later on, uh, here it says... Um, uh, to the watchers, right here it says, verse 11, And Yahweh said unto Michael, Go, bind Semyaza and his associates, who have united themselves with women, so as to defile themselves with their uncleanness. Uh, and then it says here, Bind them fast for seventy generations in the valleys of the earth, till the day of their judgment and of their consummation, till the judgment that is forever and ever. The reason I'm reading that is because I want to show you in Second Peter, uh, he was very familiar with this. Verse Second Peter 2 verse 4 for if Elohim did not spare the angels when they sinned but cast them into hell and committed them into chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until judgment you'll see that um, Jude said the same thing verse Jude 6 and the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority but left their proper dwelling he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the day, until the judgment of the great day. So it's very clear that Peter and Jude were very familiar with the book of Enoch. Uh, I'm not going to go over it today, but I have links in here uh, that talks about Matthew 22 and also how Messiah taught from the book of Enoch. For those of you that are new, they're like, why is he teaching from Jasher? Why is he teaching from Esdras? Why is he teaching from Enoch? These are all, I believe these are all scripture and vital to our, our understanding. Um, also, it talks about giants, and there's a lot of people that say, there's no giants. Well, even in the scriptures, in the, the, the canon, we see giants. Numbers 13, 30 through 33. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eats up the inhabitants of thereof, thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. They're tall. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. So literally, uh, th think of a scale between us and grasshoppers. Well, they were like grasshoppers in the sight of these giants. They're huge. Uh, of course, we had the uh, the uh, First Samuel seventeen with um, the with Goliath, and it said Goliath, whose height was six cubits in a span. There's different uh, interpretations. Either way, he was pretty tall, at least nine feet. Some people say up to twelve feet. Uh, depends on what uh, conversion. If you're looking at the royal, the Egyptian royal cubit or the regular cubit. Um, and there's, there's many more. Um, there's one in Amos that talks about how the people were as tall as the cedars. Uh, and so there's there's plenty of, of proof. Jasher 4, 16 through 21 says, uh, And in those days the sons of men departed from the ways of Yahuwah. And in those days they multiplied upon the face of the earth with sons and daughters. And they taught one another their evil practices, and they continued sinning against Yahuwah. And every man made unto himself an elo, a god. And they robbed and plundered every man his neighbor as well as his relative. And they corrupted the earth, and the earth was filled with violence. And their judges and rulers went to the daughters of men and took their wives by force from their husbands according to their choice. And the sons of men in those days took from the cattle of the earth the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air and taught the mixture of animals of one species with the other in order therewith to provoke Yahuwah. And Elohim saw the whole earth and it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted its way upon the earth, and all men and all animals. And Yahweh said, I will blot out man that I created from the face of the earth, yea, from man to the birds of the air, together with cattle and beasts that are in the field, for I repent that I made them. And all men who walked in the ways of Yahweh died in those days, before Yahweh brought evil upon man which he had declared. For this was from Yahweh, that they should not see the evil which Yahweh spoke concerning the sons of men. And Noah found grace in the sight of Yahuwah, and Yahuwah chose him and his children to raise up seed from them upon the face of the whole earth. If you're thinking one yourself, they're judges and rulers. Um, this is what I was saying earlier in Psalm 82. Whoops. So 
Elohim stands in the congregation of the Elohim. This word here is actually Elohim. So it's literally in, in English. Don't take an offense, anyone that that. <clears throat> but it literally says, God stands in the congregation of the gods. He judges among the Elohim. How long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said, you are God. He's not talking to men. He's talking to these angels. You are Elohim. And all of you are the children of the Most High, the sons of Elohim. But you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. So this, I believe, is what it's talking about when it's talking about the uh, the the judges and rulers. Jasher, I've got a uh, thing here for Jasher 9.32. It says, And Elohim said to the seventy angels who stood foremost, foremost before him, to those who were near him, saying, Come, let us descend and confuse their tongues, that one man should not understand the language of his neighbor. So uh, what I'm saying here is I believe that Yah has set seventy angels over the seventy nations. These are the Elohim. They're supposed to be the judges and rulers of the nations. However, as we saw in uh, Psalm 82, they judged and ruled in unrighteousness. In the book of Enoch, it talks about those seventy shepherds. And those 70 shepherds will be destroyed in the end of time. They'll be thrown into the lake of fire with Azazel and with the, the watchers as well. Uh, last thing I've got here, I've got a note for Jasher 5, 6 through 11. It says, After the lapse of many years, in the 480th year of the life of Noah, when all those men who followed Yahweh had died away from amongst the sons of men, and only Methuselah was then left, Elohim said unto Noah and Methuselah, saying, Speak ye and proclaim to the sons of men, saying, Thus says Yahuwah, Return from your evil ways and forsake your works, and the and Yahuwah will repent of the evil that he declared to do to you, so that it shall not come to pass. For thus says Yahuwah, Behold, I give you a period of 120 years. If you will turn to me and forsake your evil ways, then will I also turn away from the evil which I told you, and it shall not exist, says Yahuwah. And Noah and Methuselah spoke all the words of Yahweh to the sons of men day after day, constantly speaking to them. But the sons of men would not hearken to them, nor incline their ears to their words, and they were stiff-necked. And Yahweh granted them a period of 120 years, saying, If they will return, then will Elohim repent of the evil, so as to not destroy the earth. So truly, brothers and sisters, uh, our Elohim is long-suffering in all his ways. And with that, uh, we'll end our Torah portion. And I pray it was a blessing for you in some way. Uh, again, I'm going to try to get this uh, camera thing fixed before. I don't even know what to do. I'm so sorry. Um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Yahuwah Most High, we just come before you and bless you in your son Yahushua's name. Father, we thank you for your word and opening our heart to receive your word. Thank you for showing us the wonderful things written in your Torah. Father, we truly grieve that this world has forsaken your, your story, history, your true story, Father of how the heavens and the earth were created, how man was formed, how the animals formed, Father, that you formed us from the dust of the ground. And Father, we just want to stand for your ways. We just ask that you'd help give us fruit, uh, cultivating fruit out of our heart, Father, to do what's right in your sight. We love you. We thank you for the Shabbat. We thank you for all you've done for us. We bless you in Yahushua's mighty, mighty name. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise. Yeah. I think for this, we're going to go with uh, Left and Right Ministries, uh, the song of creation. But before we do that, just wanted to, um, uh, there's only, uh, it's, there's only like a week or a couple weeks left until uh, Passover, uh, about 10 days or so, actually. Um, uh, for those of you that may have not have any plans, uh, if you can travel to Lebanon, Missouri, Southwest Missouri, we'd love to invite you to come and do Passover with us. Uh, I'll try to remember to leave a link also in the description box. If not, just go to parableofthevineyard.com. The homepage will have a link uh, for Passover. We actually camp out for a whole week, um, and we just we don't only do the Passover meal, but we praise Yah for the whole week, song, dance, campfires. It's like literally some of the best times of, of our lives. So if you'd like to join us, here's your invite. Blessings, shalom, shabbat shalom. It's good to be back doing prayer portions with you. Hallelujah. Left and Right Ministries, check them out on YouTube. Yeah.
Hallelujah. 